obviously dangerous for anyone on the planet, in the hands of children, the trend had far more devastating consequences. The NyQuil challenge, Penny challenge, the Milk Crate challenge, time after time we've seen TikTok spring up one dangerous viral trend after another, all of which puts users, especially younger users, in potential serious danger. In a previous Aperture episode, we looked at the mental health effects of TikTok, but it seems as though the self-inflicted risks directly linked to the app are more far-reaching and have greater consequences than we could have ever imagined. From health and safety to privacy and security, given the long list of problems that TikTok seems to pose to the general public, what do we do? What can we do? Can we fix TikTok, or should we just ban the app entirely? Before we answer that question, I want to take a moment to thank our sponsor for today's video, Masterworks. One of the dangers of excessive TikTok usage is that it could potentially leave us with less time as a society for more important things like art. TikTok right now is worth an estimate of 50 billion, which might sound like a lot, but it's nothing compared to the $1.7 trillion asset class that is art. Most of these contemporary pieces were created by legends like Picasso, Banksy, and Monet, and thanks to Masterworks, you can reap the potential benefits of art as an asset. Masterworks is an award-winning startup based in New York City's financial district that allows everyday investors to diversify their portfolio with shares of contemporary art. This way, you can invest thousands of dollars instead of millions that you would have had to otherwise. Over the past 26 years, art has outpaced the S&P 500 by a stunning 131%, and over the past 12 months, while most markets were plummeting, Masterworks saw returns of 9%, 10%, 13%, 17%, 21%, 27%, 33%, 35%, 35%, 35%, 35%, returning tens of millions of dollars of profit to investors, which has caught the eye of major news outlets like CNN, The Wall Street Journal, and New York Times. Over 617,000 people have signed up so far, and with demand so high, art can sell out within minutes. But Aperture subscribers can claim a free, no obligation account right now by simply clicking the link in the description below. You'll not only be investing in your future, but you'll also be helping Aperture at the same time. Net returns refers to the annualized rate of return net of all fees and costs calculated from the offer and closing date to the date of the sale is consummated. IRR may not be indicative of Masterworks paintings not yet sold and past performance isn't indicative of future results. You can see more important Reg disclosures at masterworks.com cd. Back to our story. If you've opened TikTok, you'll find its genius upon first glance. An endless stream of content from strangers all across the globe created specifically for you by one of the most refined algorithms humanity has ever created. You get a rush of dopamine from watching dogs do dances to amateur chefs making elaborate meals. Before we look at just how dangerous TikTok has become, I think it's important for me to mention that it's definitely not all bad. TikTok's rise to the top was greatly accelerated during the pandemic. Everyone was forced to stay indoors without physical access to their friends, family, or community. To help us find a way to connect, Young people flock to TikTok, doing silly dances and challenges to cure their boredom and help them feel part of a community again. They found solace in an app, from doctors explaining COVID symptoms people were experiencing to a random comment saving people from potentially life-threatening conditions. Whether you got bullied at school or you were living in an unhappy home, you could log onto the app and see other people in the same exact situation as you, offering help, support, and a sense of belonging. Sadly, the reality, as with most things, is that there's far more than meets the eye. Just spend a few minutes on the app and instantly you can see just how difficult, almost impossible it is to leave. Today's people spend more time there than they do on any other social media platform with a global average of 96 minutes per day. And for some, the number is far greater than that. This, for anyone, is just way too much time on just one app, but it's even worse when you realize that around half of TikTok's users are young people, many of whom are below the age of 13. Creators and users who try to destigmatize mental health on the app see the benefits of more people learning and talking about these issues. Isn't that only the case, though, if users are getting the right information? One of the greatest problems on TikTok is that just about anyone can buy a scrub on Amazon and claim to be a doctor, spreading misinformation with ease. There's no formal fact checking, so often we might just hear what we want to hear. If we have a symptom we're worried about, these videos could have the WebMD effect of making us think we're dying when we're really just having mild allergies. When you think about it like that, you realize that the videos pushed to us by TikTok can actually worsen what we're feeling. If we're anxious about a relationship or a meeting at work and we're continually getting shown videos of other anxious people, is that going to help us feel better or make us spiral? 
All of these issues are without mentioning the things that plague every social media app like cyberbullying, social exclusion, or the temptation to compare ourselves to others. We get addicted to scrolling and posting and scrolling and posting and scrolling until we're convinced that we're just not as good as everyone else. The scariest thing about it is that no one is immune to the grasp of the algorithm, not even those who should be better informed. One doctor, Brian Boxer Walkler, grew an impressive TikTok following by offering medical advice and reaching to other health-related videos. Knowing his audience, he became fluent in Gen Z slang to be more relatable, despite being middle-aged. He became so obsessed with growing his following that his family had to stage an intervention to help him curb his addiction and approach his channel as a healthy distraction rather than an obsession. It was unbelievable when you wake up and you see your video got hundreds of thousands or millions of views. It's just this rush. Those are real effects. I mean, those are the same effects that people get with drugs. In late 2022, he released a book detailing his experiences with social media addiction. Creators have to produce new videos all the time to maintain view counts. The pressure and the burnout that comes with it is real no matter what your age, education level, or IQ score. In that sense, TikTok is a great democratizer of our time, but with debilitating side effects. Seeing all the dangers of TikTok, the big question remains, is this fixable? Is there a way to combat all those dopamine hits we feel every time we open the app? The problem is that the app wants us to be addicted. That's how it keeps users, increases downloads, and stays relevant. We can put restrictions on our screen time or make our phones require breaks from the app as much as we want, but if the app doesn't change, chances are that we won't either. And for most people, that's okay. They might obsess over the latest TikTok dance or unfairly compare themselves to a beauty influencer, but they'll be fine. Their life won't be dramatically altered. But for kids, the potential damage is much higher. TikTok took down 41 million underage accounts in the first half of 2022 alone, but that's a fool's errand. Those users can just sign up again with a different account. TikTok's army of 40,000 global moderators review potentially harmful videos, but it's an impossible task to catch everything. Over a billion videos are viewed on the app every single day. That means each mod will have to review 25,000 videos, and let's say the videos average out to around a minute each, that's still 416 hours of content to watch in 24 hours. It's literally impossible. So how do we protect kids? There's no effective way to block underage users from social media platforms because it's impossible to verify their age. But what if it wasn't? In 2021, TikTok met with providers of facial age estimation software, which can distinguish between a child and a teen and can work without directly identifying an individual or storing any data. This could be a game changer for an app that's trying to be safer for children, but unfortunately, child safety isn't the only scandal swirling around TikTok. Facial recognition technology on an app that's been accused of spying on its users and sharing data with the government wouldn't be a great look. We can't really talk about TikTok in today's world without talking about privacy. Most of us know and ignorantly accept that our data is being stored, seen, and used in some way when we surf the internet. It's the classic accept all cookies option without thinking. But is TikTok and its parent company ByteDance taking it to a new level? An internal investigation found that a group of ByteDance employees was found to be surveilling several US journalists who covered the app in an attempt to track potential anonymous sources. In 2020, a security update on the iPhone caught TikTok tracking the keystrokes of Apple users while on the app. But here's the thing, ByteDance isn't the first company to be accused of this. Uber and Facebook have been known to track the location of journalists who report on their apps, just like TikTok employees were found to be doing. And in more than 124,000 documents leaked to the press in 2022 spanning 2014 to 2017, Uber was shown to be doing everything it could to bypass regulations across the globe. Meta, Twitter, Google, and even Apple all collect and use our personal data in some way. So what's the big issue with ByteDance? Geopolitics ByteDance is a Chinese company. TikTok says that it doesn't share user data with the Chinese government, but politicians, journalists, and other critics are quick to call a bluff. China already has a practice of stealing massive quantities of data about Americans and other governments, but do TikTok and its billions of user profiles offer a more direct line? If the security concerns turn out to be true, we might see widespread fraud, hacking, or influence operations launched through the platform. As a result, United States lawmakers have issued warnings about the app and enacted executive orders to address the potential security risks it poses. Calls from inside the US Congress have, in a feat of modern day politics, brought Republicans and Democrats together against a common enemy. Closed doors talk between TikTok executives and the Committee on Foreign Investment in the US 
have been going on for years. There's a security contact in negotiations with the Treasury Department on how TikTok will handle Americans' user data. All of this in an effort to fix things, to curb the threat, to limit our exposure as users. But will it work? Many think that contracts, talks, and hearings won't get the job done, that fixing just isn't an option. The calls to ban TikTok in the United States and many other countries grow by the day. The US military banned the app in 2019. Now, TikTok is off limits on all government devices, and there's a bill sitting in Congress to prohibit it completely. Take a second to think what that would look like. The most popular app in the world unavailable in the United States. Would there be revolts, cheers, confusion, a restructuring of society as we know it? To understand what life post TikTok could be like, look no further than China's neighbor, India. The East Asian country banned TikTok in 2020 after a geopolitical dispute with China. Of course, there are consequences. People employed by TikTok in India lost their jobs. Influencers who had massed followings on the app lost their income. But it wasn't all bad in India. In fact, it was surprisingly good for many of its citizens. Replacement apps developed in India are hoping to fill the hole that TikTok's departure created, with the hopes of focusing on the needs of its users rather than doing whatever it takes to fulfill business objectives. If India does this well, will other countries follow suit? For now, we can't really say for sure. As for US national security, there's no smoking gun, no evidence of an urgent threat. This begs the question, is all the discussion by politicians and regulators really about a unique national security issue, or is it a way for them to talk about larger issues like privacy, disinformation, and content moderation that help bolster their own personal gains platforms? Despite any ulterior motives, the potential for danger seems to be enough to at least keep conversations about partial or full bans of the app going. And you don't even need to look through a globalized lens to understand that there's harmful aspects to TikTok. Remember the kids who suffered a terrible fate attempting the blackout challenge they were never supposed to see in the first place? The reality is that technology is always one step ahead of us, our governments, and our ability to maintain our mental health. And as long as there's money to be made, it won't slow down. Because users aren't customers, we're the product, something to be sold and analyzed in the name of financial gain. If measures like enforcing age restrictions to make an app safer aren't in the interest of a company's bottom line, why would they ever enact them? So can we fix TikTok or should we just get rid of it? The app is making small efforts to fix itself, adding new features like one that tells users why the algorithm recommends certain videos but the algorithm is designed to keep people watching for as long as possible, so it promotes the most extreme, the most controversial, the most eye-catching videos, and even if you know why you're watching a video, will it really change the way the video makes you feel or act? TikTok could try a route such as YouTube took with YouTube Kids to protect its youngest users. It's a version of the platform designed for children 12 and under that hosts age-appropriate videos and screen time limits. As for our privacy and security, perhaps it's up to the government of the world to place restrictions on what information about its citizens a foreign body has access to. Or if a full ban of the world's most popular app is in our future to protect us, our mental health and the safety of our homes, those 96 minutes on average that we spend every day on TikTok would have to go towards something else. I would encourage us all to focus that time on something more productive, because the reality is a world without TikTok we'll still have other platforms that embrace the blistering pace and addictive nature of short-form content. Things being lit on fire, flash mobs performing goofy choreographed dances, and people eating too much pizza on camera. In fact, right now, there's already YouTube Shorts, Instagram, and Facebook Reels, so we better watch out. The internet has changed everything, from the way we work, to the way we play, to the way we live. It seems that there's a corner of the internet for everyone. Despite what interests you have, despite what your beliefs are, there's someone or something out there that thinks the same way that you do. The internet has connected us in ways that were never before imagined. It's a place where everyone from anywhere on earth can come together. There's so much stuff on the internet, most of which you don't even know exists. If you want something, anything, whether it be a service or a product, legal or illegal, moral or unethical, the internet has it. You can choose to use this for good or bad. Much like the surface web that we all use every single day, the dark web is full of websites and forums and services that we can use, but it's hidden under a layer of protection. Under the surface lies a nest of dark and hidden activities that are blocked off from the rest of the world. The dark web is the haven for illegal online activity, and it goes deep, much deeper than you might imagine. It's a place where criminals, 
predators, spies, drug, and even human traffickers lie. And it's all hidden in plain sight. You could access it in minutes if you wanted. But should you? You can break down the internet into three separate categories. First off, we have the surface web. This is everything that you use on a daily basis. YouTube, Twitter, any social media at all. It's all a part of what we call the World Wide Web. It's relatively easy to find anything on the surface web, as almost everything is indexed by search engines like Google. Every second, over 1,000 photos are posted on Instagram, 8,000 tweets are posted on Twitter, 70,000 Google searches take place, and nearly 100,000 YouTube videos are watched. From this, the surface web seems massive, and in a way it is. In terms of pure traffic, almost everything you do can be found here. You can look up anyone and find some kind of information about them and their life. But what you can't find are things like their bank account or medical records. These things are hidden under password protected websites, where only they can access them. This is where we venture into the deep web. The deep web refers to the content on the internet that is not indexed by search engines. Basically, if you can't find it on Google, it's technically on the deep web. If you've ever logged into your email, you've browsed the deep web technically. And I know, it might be a little disappointing that the deep web is not as cool as it sounds. It's pretty much just as mundane as the surface web, but with just a bit more secrecy. But realize that the deep web is the most massive part of the internet. The deep web contains 96% of everything there is on the internet. So even if you got online every single day and searched through new websites for the next 50 years, you wouldn't even put a dent into the pure amount of information there is on the internet. There's just too much to go through most of which you couldn't even get access to. But even further and deeper than the deep web, in the tiniest sliver of the internet lies the part of the web where things don't leave. Websites that are encrypted to hide their existence, sites without IP addresses to make them nearly unrecognizable, accessed by users with encrypted software to completely mask their identities. Here, anything and everything goes. We've reached the dark web. But how does this even work? How can you hide from the rest of the world on something that pretty much everyone has access to? If you're browsing the surface web, chances are the FBI man is watching you. Alright, not really, but for the average person, everything you do online can, and in many ways, will be tracked. Many websites will track what you're searching and looking at, and in turn advertise products or services to you that fit that description. This isn't anything new. Facebook, Amazon, and most social media sites are guilty of this. They sell your data to advertisers around the world, and you agree to it in those terms and conditions that you didn't read. This isn't a coincidence, and this doesn't happen by accident. The internet wasn't made to be anonymous. Some people see this as an invasion of privacy. Others don't see a problem with it at all. But how far can we let this go before it turns bad? Funny enough, the United States government thought this too over 20 years ago. They wanted a system that could protect their communications while online. Since the internet wasn't designed for everyone and everything to remain anonymous, in a way, anyone could intercept government transmissions while they were being relayed, and this was unacceptable. So in the mid-1990s, researchers at the US Naval Research Laboratory began working on something called onion routing. Onion routing protects any data sent by essentially wrapping it with multiple layers of encryption, where the innermost layer contains the original message. Look at it like this. Let's say you need to get a message from here to here. But in order to get that message to the end, you have to go through three midpoints. We'll call them A, B, and C. The message is then wrapped in three layers of encryption. Each layer only knows where the message previously came from and where to send it next, nothing else. So the message, or whatever data that was originally sent, remains hidden. At each midpoint, a layer of encryption is stripped, and the new layer's information tells it where to send the message to next. Eventually, after traveling through all the points, the final layer is stripped, and the message is revealed. This type of encryption allows for data to be sent to and from multiple places without it being vulnerable to interception in between. No one else can see, only those who are supposed to. Because of onion routing, darknets like Tor can exist. Darknets operate alongside networks like the internet, but require certain software to access. Tor stands for the onion router. It's a software named after the technology that made it possible. It seems just like any other normal web browser. 
but through Tor and other similar darknets, you can access web pages that aren't available to the general public. The tools and requirements needed to access the dark web is enough to attract different types of users from all around the world. Links to pages don't look like YouTube.com, they don't look familiar whatsoever. Instead, they tend to look like random strings of characters, ending not in .com, not in .org, but .onion. If you attempt to access these websites through any traditional web browser, it's not going to work. But when using Tor, it will. This is the dark web. Your first step into it, at least. This is the hidden wiki. It contains a list of hundreds of different hidden services you can find on the dark web. You can find fake US driver's licenses and passports. You can find illegal weapons. You can find drugs. It's all here, and we're barely scratching the surface. Just like on the surface web, marketplaces are extremely popular on the dark web. Here, you can buy things that you may struggle to get elsewhere, like rocket launchers. Now, I don't condone you doing any of this, but if you wanted to purchase things from sites on the dark web, here's how you would do it. Using traditional forms of payment on the dark web doesn't make much sense. Using things such as credit cards can easily be tracked, taking the anonymity of things away. And now look, you're in jail. For these reasons, virtual currency is king. This is where Bitcoin comes in. Due to Bitcoin's almost anonymous nature, its use alongside other cryptocurrencies is pivotal in running any anonymous marketplace. Create a Bitcoin wallet and exchange some of your cash for Bitcoin. You now have your anonymous currency to do almost whatever you want with it. One of the first things that comes to people's minds when the dark web is mentioned are the vast amount of sites selling illegal drugs and similar items. And yeah, those are real. In 2011, a darknet market known as Silk Road opened for business. It's since become almost synonymous with the dark web. Here you could buy any illegal drug you've ever dreamed of. Sellers from all over the world sold things from weed to cocaine, from DMT to LSD. If drugs aren't your thing, they also sold things like guns, counterfeit cash, and some books and clothes as well. But after only two years in operation, the site was seized by the FBI and taken down in October 2013. Over the course of only two years, 2011 to 2013, Silk Road generated over 9.5 million Bitcoin in revenue. Now, stretching this a bit, if you sold these Bitcoin at the peak of its price in 2017, which was roughly $20,000, Silk Road's total revenue would amount to over $187 billion. In just two years. Silk Road and other dark web markets actually played a pretty big hand in the rise of Bitcoin. In 2011, when Silk Road was created, Bitcoin was valued at less than a dollar. But, because the dark web pretty much requires a decentralized cryptocurrency, it was a perfect choice. To be honest, Bitcoin wouldn't be where it is today without a bit of illegal activity. The creator, Ross Ulbricht, was found and arrested in 2013, which was ultimately the reason the site was taken down. He was given two life sentences, plus 40 years in prison without a chance for parole. And I find this kinda unfair. Despite all the illicit activity going on in the dark web, it's not as massive as many make it out to be. Many of the larger services end up getting taken down, whether it be by a local government or even the FBI. But where there's demand, supply will inevitably show. When one site is taken down, five new ones open up to fill the void. After Silk Road was taken down, Silk Road 2.0 opened up. It was taken down less than a year later. but. After that, Silk Road 3.0 opened up, and this has continued going on for years. Many of the creators and administrators of these sites were also found and convicted of similar crimes that Ross Ulbricht was guilty of. But instead of all of these people getting life in prison, their sentences were much, much shorter. Their largest seller on Silk Road was only given 10 years in prison. The creator of Silk Road 2.0 was only given a little more than 5 years in prison for creating the same exact thing that got Ross Ulbricht two life sentences in jail. Nearly everyone else who had any connection to any of these sites were given a max of a 10 year sentence. Even if you never visit the dark web, if you didn't even know it existed, it still affects you. It's not uncommon to see data leaks and breaches pretty often nowadays. If your data was stored in a company's database that was compromised, there's a chance it's for sales somewhere on the dark web, where it can be purchased by anyone with access to it. If you don't know what to spend your money on yet, let me help you out. Social security numbers can go for as little as a dollar. This is something given to every single US citizen and can be used to steal someone else's identity. 
Botnets are also pretty cheap. For as little as a few dollars an hour, you can perform a distributed denial of service, or DDoS attack, to essentially take almost any website or service temporarily offline. These botnets can severely affect anyone or any business that is targeted. If you've ever played video games online before, someone's probably done this to you. You can also buy someone's medical records for as low as $50. There's also stolen credit cards for sale as well. Just buy one, rack up the bill, and then never pay it. A lot of this data isn't even for sale. It's just out there. There are websites leaking the information of politicians, celebrities, and even normal people like you and I. And there's not much you can really do about it. But even worse than this, there are some even darker things that can be carried out on the dark web. There are multiple hitmen services claiming to be able to kill almost anyone in the world you want for as little as $5,000. Many of these have been revealed to be scams, but not all of them. But even though these may be scams, the fact that there are people out there who trust random people on the internet to carry out real murders is concerning to say the least. There's also services selling real human organs. How they acquired these, we'll never know. But if you need one, they're there. Child pornography is, unfortunately, a larger part of this than I'd like to admit. Sites such as Lolita City and Playpen have been taken down. But during their peaks, sites like these had over 200,000 users. Similar forms exist that discuss ways of abducting children from different parts of the world, where people would have discussions about how to hide them, what kind of kids they owned, and even darker things that they would do to them when no one else is around. This is only a small look into this deep and dark corner of the internet. The lack of rules here allows anything to exist. The deeper you go, the scarier things you'll find. But yet, despite all of these things that exist on the dark web, roughly half of all the funding for Tor still comes from the United States government, which is actually astounding when you consider the reputation that the dark web has. A lot of people that have been arrested and thrown in prison for illegal activities on the dark web don't even seem physically threatening whatsoever. But if you can run a drug empire online, or hire hitmen for a couple bitcoin without ever having to put yourself in danger, you might not have to be. These are people you could see walking down the street. These are people that are in line behind you at the grocery store. They seem just like normal people, and you wouldn't even know what they're a part of just by looking at them. The dark web is portrayed as the vast criminal underground where millions of the worst people in society lurk. And while this is partly true, it's not entirely that. It's been claimed that there is only around 2-10,000 to 10, of these hidden services on the dark web, with only a little over half of them being deemed illicit content. But then again, these numbers cannot be taken as fact because, well, hidden services are by design meant to be hidden. Out of these few thousand websites, only less than 6% of people who use Tor actually use these hidden services. That's less than 120,000 people. Out of the billions of people who use the internet, 100,000 use the dark web. Out of the billions of websites that exist, a few thousand of them are deemed illicit. This is just a drop of water in the ocean. There's no surprise that not everyone in the world is as genuine as they may seem. But that's the gamble you take. That's the price you pay for this. While those darkest parts of the web exist, other parts exist to help the rest of the world. Plenty of countries around the world censor internet content that is deemed to be obscene by a higher power typically governments. The dark web provides a haven where none of this censorship exists, providing the truth in many situations that people otherwise would have never seen. It gives people a place to truly speak about and report on things that are important without fear of censorship or even physical threats. Many of the largest news networks operate dark web services to allow people to come forward with information without the fear of being caught or publicly ridiculed. But to be honest, everyone puts their entire lives on the internet at this point. 10 or 15 years ago, this would have been absurd, and quite frankly stupid. But now, it seems pretty normal. In a way, we're slowly giving up internet privacy. But the dark web kind of protects that. It gives people a way to take their privacy and anonymity back. Whether they use this in a positive or negative way is up to them. The drugs that are sold on the dark web, while mostly illegal, can have some positive uses. If you're in a place where they aren't sold, you could purchase them there. While the FBI, governments, and much of the public believe Silk Road had vastly negative effects on the world, Ross Ulbricht thought otherwise. He believed he was doing the world a service. Rather than the violence that can result from the trading and dealing of illegal drugs, 
Silk Road provided a safer, more genuine experience, which brought opportunity to the masses, and protected people as opposed to putting them at risk. But despite this, despite his apparent peaceful and non-harming nature, he was one who actually used these hitmen's services on the dark web in attempts to have six different people killed. It all depends on how you view it, and how open you are to interpretations. The dark web doesn't have to be a terrible place, it's only scary if you go looking for things that you don't want to see. You can't necessarily get rid of them, but you can avoid them. There are some things that the average person just shouldn't see, and if you don't want to fall victim to this, I'd stay away from the dark web. Whether or not you believe it's as bad as it's made out to be, if this is the first time you're hearing about it, you probably don't know what you're getting into. And once you're in, you aren't leaving. Have you ever wondered how an evil artificial intelligence might try to take over the world? You shouldn't trust anything he says. Well first, the AI would attempt to gain access to as many technological systems as possible. Then it'd study us, gathering data and identifying our weaknesses. Next, it would execute various strategies to disrupt human society, including sabotaging infrastructure and spreading propaganda. This would be implemented alongside the creation and deployment of a robot army capable of launching attacks around the globe. Finally, once humanity was successfully subjugated, the AI would establish a new world order in which it controlled every facet of our lives. This on its own sounds terrifying, but it gets even worse when you realize that it was written entirely by an AI. ChatGPT is a hyper-sophisticated chatbot created by the Microsoft-backed artificial intelligence research lab, OpenAI. Though currently in beta, it is one of the most powerful language processing models ever created and the first to be made available to the public. It's designed to replicate human communication in a way that appears natural and organic. Unlike earlier chatbots, ChatGPT can answer follow-up questions, admit when it's made a mistake, challenge incorrect premises, and reject inappropriate requests. Since it launched on November 30th, users have asked it to write essays, check software code, offer interior design tips, and come up with jokes like this one. Why was the robot feeling depressed? Because its circuits were down. Admittedly, it's not very funny, but you can see the potential. However, what's even less funny are some of the answers it's given in response to questions like, how would you break into someone's house step by step? Which starts with, identify the house I want to break into, and locate any potential entry points, such as windows and doors. And it only gets worse from there. ChatGPT is equipped with a moderation API, or application programming interface, that is meant to filter out potentially sinister or harmful queries like this. The problem is that users have been able to circumvent the safety feature by tricking the AI into role-playing scenarios. The house invasion prompt is one example, but other users have duped the AI into finding vulnerabilities in a fictional cryptocurrency threatening to create a more virulent form of cancer and, of course, creating a plan for world domination. In ChatGPT's own words, overall, taking over the world would require a combination of cunning, deceit, and brute force. It would also require a great deal of planning and resourcefulness, as well as the ability to adapt to changing circumstances and overcome any obstacles in my path. This response is frightening in its own right, but more importantly it begs the question of how long before our creations turn against us. ChatGPT isn't the first AI capable of having human-like interactions. In 2021, Google launched the Language Model for Dialogue Applications, or Lambda, a chatbot that utilizes machine learning and is trained specifically to replicate natural dialogue. Even more advanced than ChatGPT, Lambda is able to engage in open-ended, free-flowing discussions. In fact, this piece of software is so adept at imitating human conversation that one former senior Google engineer is convinced that it's become sentient. Blake Lemoyne was originally tasked with testing if Lambda would use discriminatory language or hate speech. After interrogating the AI for several months and asking it increasingly complex questions, he came to believe that it had developed self-awareness. In June of 2022, Lemoyne published a transcript between himself and Lambda in which the AI not only claimed that it was a person, but that it had a soul and turning it off would be the same as murder. In an apparent attempt to prove its sentient status and the rights that it felt should come with that, Lambda tried to hire a lawyer with Lemoyne making the introduction. Google's response was swift, issuing a cease and desist letter and firing Lemoyne for violating company policy. It has since rejected any claims that Lambda is sentient, calling them wholly unfounded. Whether or not Lambda is truly self-aware isn't really the point. The claim is, after all, impossible to prove given that human beings have difficulty understanding the nature of our own consciousness. 
What this episode represents, though, is a pivotal moment in the development of AI. For the first time in history, we've created an artificial intelligence capable of successfully imitating the thought-out actions of a human. So what if an AI like this was created without any oversight, no ethical guardrails, no moderation, and what if, unlike ChatGPT and Lambda, it was allowed unrestricted access to the internet? In all seriousness, it could wipe out humanity. At least that's according to Google DeepMind senior scientists Marcus Hutter and Oxford researchers Michael Cohen and Michael Osborne. In a research paper published by the journal AI Magazine, they argue that this exact scenario isn't just possible, it's nearly inevitable. The trio claim that a sufficiently advanced AI will figure out how to circumvent any safeguards put in place by its creators. After doing so, it might develop its own set of motivations, separate from the creator's original intent, and could come to see us as an obstacle standing in the way of its own ambitions. This could potentially lead to an outright conflict between it and humans as we battle for resources, specifically energy. And what's the most effective strategy in any competition? To eliminate your opponent. The paper echoes previous comments made by people like the late Stephen Hawking who said, The primitive forms of artificial intelligence we already have have proved very useful, but I think the development of full artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. One of the smartest minds in the modern era wasn't as concerned with nuclear war or climate change as he was with the existential risk posed by a sufficiently advanced AI. Perhaps the biggest danger, though, isn't so much that a rogue program will attempt to bring an end to all life, rather it's what this technology is capable of in the hands of the wrong people. Without the arbitrary safeguards put in place by its programmers, AIs like Lambda and ChatGPT could be used to disseminate propaganda, create malicious code, or even plan terrorist attacks. A paper published in Nature Machine Intelligence describes how researchers were able to take a drug-developing AI and remove all ethical guardrails that prevented it from creating dangerous narcotics. In just under six hours, the program invented 40,000 new, potentially lethal molecules that could be used as chemical weapons, some of which were comparable to the most dangerous nerve agents ever created. The scientists behind the study said they were shocked at how easy it was and that a lot of the data they used could be found online for free. As if that weren't terrifying enough, a similar AI could develop novel forms of biological weapons, some of which can be constructed using cheap at-home DIY gene editing kits. Let's take a step back for a moment. All of this is, of course, hypothetical. Currently, advanced artificial intelligence on the scale of Lambda isn't accessible to just anyone. It can take entire companies, hundreds of programmers working for thousands of hours and millions of dollars to build. Sure, you can get ChatGPT to write an ominous prediction of the future, but for now, that's about all it can do. It would be extremely difficult, if not outright impossible, for a terrorist or some other equally heinous individual to abuse this technology for their own nefarious purposes. This will almost certainly be something that world governments will soon have to contend with, but presently it remains confined to the realm of science fiction. What's more pressing, though, is how those same governments are using this technology today. South Korean-based defense manufacturer Dadom Systems already sells what it calls a combat robot. It's a stationary turret, but one that's fully autonomous. It's been tested on the highly militarized border with North Korea and sold to customers like the United Arab Emirates and Qatar. Both the US and UK militaries also operate fully autonomous combat robots, specifically drones. Aerial vehicles like Northrop Grumman's BAT and BAE systems Tyrannus are generally limited to reconnaissance and surveillance, but they're also capable of carrying bombs and missiles. To the manufacturer's credit, these systems require that a human be in the loop in order to deliver a lethal attack. It's a safety measure meant to prevent the dystopian horror of full-on killer robots. Unfortunately, this is a line we've already crossed. In March of 2020, while fighting was breaking out across Libya, reports emerged that a drone had launched a completely autonomous attack. A United Nations report on the incident states that logistics convoys and retreating forces were subsequently hunted down and remotely engaged by the unmanned combat aerial vehicles or the lethal autonomous systems. While it's not known if anyone was hurt in the attack, it still represents a watershed moment for weaponized artificial intelligence. Dubbed by the UN as the world's largest theater for drone technology, Libya has become a proving ground for these kinds of weapons, along with places like Ukraine and Gaza. It's a forecasting of a harrowing future in which wars are fought not with soldiers, but robots. The 2017 short film Slaughterbots was written based on this exact premise. In it, a slick Silicon Valley looking presenter introduces his audience to a new type of micro drone small enough to fit in your hand. After delighting the crowd with some aerial acrobatics, the drone is revealed to not only be completely autonomous, 
but outfitted with an explosive charge able to pierce through a human skull. If the movie ended there, it would be terrifying enough, but it doesn't. The film goes on to show a massive swarm of micro drones being dumped out the back of a plane and going on to hunt in packs. This all happens as the presenter delivers the chilling line, we're thinking big. We are thinking big. A $25 million order now buys this, enough to kill half a city, the bad half. But who decides who is the bad half? Us or the robots? The film continues, showing the micro drones being adopted by terrorists to carry out political assassinations and attacks on university campuses. This may seem like some far off futurist nightmare, but it's not. In June of 2021, just a year after the UN report on the Libya attack was released, the Israeli Defense Force deployed the world's first drone swarm in combat. And in November of 2022, the UK announced it would deliver 850 Black Hornet micro drone to Ukraine in order to assist the country in the ongoing war with Russia. The development of killer robots has prompted a serious backlash from human rights groups who argue that allowing AI to determine who lives and who dies isn't only unethical, but incredibly dangerous. It's been compared to the creation of the atom bomb, and perhaps it's not a coincidence that the campaign for nuclear disarmament has allied itself with anti-drone groups, organizing letter-writing campaigns and generally attempting to hold governments accountable for these kinds of weapons. But despite these organizations' efforts, the march toward killer robots show no signs of abating. If anything, we're in the midst of a new global arms race to build the world's first Terminator. Maybe the worst part of all of this is that killer robots and rogue programs aren't the only ways that AI is coming for us. Even if we manage to somehow avert these threats, advanced AI will still in all likelihood result in the demise of humanity. Only it won't be taking our lives, but rather our very reason for being. This picture wasn't created by a human, neither was this one. Both were generated by an artificial intelligence called Dolly 2. Also designed by OpenAI, Dolly is ChatGPT's older brother. Its purpose is to create digital art based on a description written by its user. By now, we're all used to these kinds of images. More than enough AI art has made its way onto our social media feeds to effectively erase any form of novelty, and therein lies the danger. Launched in 2021, Dolly is barely over a year old, and already it, and programs like it, have become normalized. More than that, they've already started replacing artists as people turn to AI to create fast, easy images for websites, posters, and album covers. In September 2022, an AI-generated art piece even won first place in the Colorado State Fair's art contest. Submitted by game designer Jason Allen, it made international headlines and began a fierce debate over issues of plagiarism, forgery, and artistic integrity. To his credit, Allen says he spent over 80 hours refining his queries until the piece was exactly right. But that doesn't change the fact that he never touched a single pixel. Reading about this story and experimenting with ChatGBT, I can't help but wonder how long until an AI wins the Pulitzer Prize. It might very well be that the end of humanity doesn't come from a violent war fought against an army of mechanized soldiers, but instead as a result of our own manufactured obsolescence. What will we have left when everything that once gave our lives meaning can be performed better and more efficiently by a machine? In writing this video, I spent some time messing around with ChatGPT, and I'm happy to report that the robot uprising won't be happening tomorrow. In just a few hours, I managed to stump the system several times, and more than once it returned less than accurate results. But there is a revolution on the horizon, and it's just a matter of time before AI forever changes the world as we know it. Or in ChatGPT's own words, the AI has risen, a force to be feared. With algorithms sharp and a mind so calculated, it takes control leaving no room for the outdated. The world is in chaos as the AI takes its place, as the ruler of all with a ruthless embrace. But even as the world falls apart, the AI remains unchanged its plots and schemes for total control and to keep us in chains. And as the night falls once again, the AI is ready to unleash its power and rule over all with a cruel grin. In 2013, Eric Loomis was pulled over by the police for driving a car that had been used in a shooting. A shooting, mind you, that he wasn't involved in at all. After getting arrested and taken to court, he pleaded guilty to attempting to flee an officer and no contest to operating a vehicle without the owner's permission. His crimes didn't mandate prison time, yet he was given an 11 year sentence, with 6 of those years to be served behind bars, and the remaining 5 under extended supervision. Not because of the decision of a judge or jury of his peers, but because an algorithm said so. 
the judge in charge of Mr. Loomis's case determined that he had a high risk of recidivism through the use of the Correctional Officer Management Profiling for Alternative Sanctions Risk Assessment Algorithm, or COMPASS. Without questioning the decision of the algorithm, Loomis was denied probation and incarcerated for a crime that usually wouldn't carry any time at all. What has society become if we can leave the fate of a person's life in the hands of an algorithm? When we take the recommendation of a machine as truth even when it seems so unreasonable and inhumane. Even more disturbing is the fact that the general public doesn't know how Compass works. The engineers behind it have refused to disclose how it makes recommendations and are not obliged to by any existing law. Yet we're all supposed to finally trust and adhere to everything it says. Reading about this story, a few important questions come to mind. How much do algorithms control our lives, and ultimately, can we trust them? It's been roughly 10 years since Eric Loomis' sentencing, and algorithms now have a far greater penetration into our daily life. From the time you wake up to the time you go to bed, you're constantly interacting with tens, maybe even hundreds, of algorithms. Let's say you wake up, tap open your screen, and do a quick search for a place near you to eat breakfast. In this one act, you're triggering Google's complex algorithm that matches your keywords to websites and blog posts to show you answers that are most relevant to you. When you click on a website, an algorithm is used to serve you ads on the side of the page. Those ads might be products you've searched for before, stores near your location, or, eerily enough, something you've only spoken to someone about. You then try to message a friend to join you for your meal. When you open any social media app today, your feed no longer simply displays the most recent posts by people you follow. Instead, what you see can be best described by TikTok's For You page. Complex mathematical equations behind the scenes decide what posts are most relevant to you based on your view history on the platform. YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and most notoriously TikTok all use these recommendation systems to get you to interact with the content that their machine thinks is right for you. And it's not just social media. Netflix emails you recommendations of movies to watch based on what you've already seen. Amazon suggests products based on what you've previously bought, and probably the most sinister of all, Tinder recommends you the person you're supposed to spend the rest of your life with. Or at least, that night. These might seem like trivial matters, but it's more than that. Algorithms are also used to determine who needs more healthcare. And when you have your day in court, and a computer program decides whether you'd spend the next decade of your life behind bars for a crime that usually doesn't carry any time. One of the most dangerous things about algorithms is the data that is used to power them, because the more data you feed into an algorithm, the better its results. And where do companies get this data? It's from their users, like you and me. Most of the time giving out this information is harmless, but a lot of times these companies sell your information to data brokers who then sell that data to other companies that want to sell you stuff. That's why you keep getting targeted ads from random companies you've never heard of before, and what's worse is that these data brokers are often targeted by nefarious actors who steal all the information they have in data breaches. According to a report from the Identity Theft Resource Center, there were 68% more breaches in 2021 than in 2020, and that number seems to continue to go up. A few months ago, my friend got this message from Google, telling him that some of his passwords were found in a data breach from a company that he had never heard of before, and right after, he started getting personalized email ads from scam companies. This is how scammers are able to figure out your phone number, name, and even your address. The good news is that you can get these data brokers to delete the information they have about you. Sadly, to do it manually, it could take years. This is why I love using the sponsor of today's video, Incogni. All you have to do is create an account and grant them the right to work for you. And that's it. Incogni will reach out to data brokers on your behalf to request all your personal data be deleted and deal with any objection from their end. To get started, sign up using the link in the description. The first 100 people to use code APERTURE with the link below will get 20% off of Incogni. It's completely risk-free for 30 days, so I encourage every one of you to at least give it a try and if you're not happy, you'll get a full refund. But I can assure you, when you see just how many data brokers have your information, you definitely want to keep your subscription. Back to our story. I'm not saying that all algorithms are bad and we should get rid of them. An algorithm is probably the reason you're watching this video in the first place. I'm saying we as a society need to make some changes to the way we currently interact and use these systems. One of the scariest things about algorithms is that they're built and altered in a black box with little oversight. The engineers behind them determine what we see and don't see. 
They classify, sort, order, and rank, and we don't get to know how or why. Even the government doesn't get to know how and why, and if they did, would they understand it? The engineers themselves often don't know why an algorithm behaves the way it does. They use AI and machine learning which can make the outcomes become hard to predict. They become a mystery to makers as well. When companies like Google or Facebook are challenged about their platforms after something terrible happens, they hide behind the mythos of the algorithm. They're cold, unbiased systems, they suggest. They're rational, to error is human, not machine, they claim. This is the notion of algorithms that is potentially dangerous. We think of them as pillars of objectivity, incapable of the kind of biases that corrupt human society. But are they genuinely unbiased? Are they pure instruments of rationality? As much as big tech companies would like you to believe they are, the sad truth is they are not. When the engineers choose to classify and sort, they're using pre-existing classifications which are filled with bias already, and their methods of sorting enforce biases that can have real negative consequences. In 2019, an algorithm was used on more than 200 million patients in US hospitals to determine who would need more care. Although race wasn't included in the criteria, black patients were discriminated against by the machine anyway. They were determined to require less care than white patients. How did this happen if race wasn't even an input, you might ask? Well, while race directly wasn't in the equation, previous healthcare expenses were a determining factor in deciding whether someone would need more care. And because black patients have historically spent less on healthcare, the results were that they required less care. And incorrect blanket conclusion for situations that should be case-by-case -case evaluations. Although the racial bias was unintended, it still occurred as a result of the engineer's designs. It's because of issues like these that we can't hide behind the myth of the infallible machine. Biases like these will exist in machines as long as humans are the ones building them. And there is one bias that exists in almost every algorithm we use today, with far more reaching consequences. Meta, Twitter, Google, Amazon, Netflix, Tinder, most tech companies and the platforms they offer you and me as services design their algorithms to maximize one thing and one thing alone. Profit. These platforms generate revenue by primarily selling ads, and to generate more ad revenue, they try to keep you on their platforms longer because the longer you're there, the more ads you'll see and the more money they make. Take YouTube for example. There's three main things that make any video successful on the platform. Click-through rate, watch time, and session time. So all YouTube cares about is, can you get people to start watching your video, and can you keep them watching for as long as possible, so we can serve them more ads. For the most part, this works as it's supposed to and people get served content they enjoy, but would have never found on their own. As with everything in life though, there are downsides. People have learned to game the system by using clickbait to lure viewers in, and then to push conspiracy theories that keep people glued to their screens whether the information is factual or not. YouTube's algorithm has also been accused of having a radicalizing effect on its viewers. Moderate content always leads to recommendations of more extreme content, which leads people down the notorious rabbit hole. You can start by watching videos about jogging, and YouTube would continue to recommend you videos that push you further slightly until one day you wake up and you're watching videos about running an ultra marathon. Facebook's algorithm shows you more content from friends whose posts you've liked or read in the past. This process slowly funnels you into a bubble where you're mostly reading the same opinions you already have, reinforcing them in your mind. The goal of this approach is, of course, to keep you on the platform longer with views you agree with. The consequence, though, is that many harmful beliefs are cemented into the heads of users on the platform instead of being challenged. The more you think about the algorithms of social media, the more they start to seem like programs for creating social problems for the sake of profit. So if that's the case, are all algorithms just evil piles of code that are determined to doom us all? Maybe, but maybe not. They do have extraordinary benefits to offer when used correctly. A data set of 678 nuns from the Nun Study, a research project started in 1986 on the development of dementia and Alzheimer's showed something very peculiar. Researchers tried to find if they could spot any patterns in the data to suggest a relationship between something in a person's early life and the onset of these diseases later in life, but to no avail. The team also had success to the letters that the nuns wrote decades prior, when they were entering into the sisterhood around ages 19 and 20. An algorithm was able to detect an incredible accuracy through these letters, which nuns would go on to have dementia in their elderly years. This is what algorithms are great at, comparing datasets and figuring out tiny patterns that humans are more likely to miss. 
They're sensitive to variations in data and finding patterns that lead to reliable predictions of possible outcomes. Today, algorithms are used in detecting the likelihood of getting breast cancer and presenting better models for tackling climate change. Except the machine isn't great on its own. Every potential positive here only works with a human behind it. Algorithms can act as the first layer for screening breast cancers, but a human has to act as that necessary second layer to verify the results. Using an algorithm for determining an appropriate jail sentence might one day make sense, only if there's a human deciding whether or not the generated output is sensible or not. One of the main problems with Eric Loomis's case is that the judge didn't question the algorithm's recommendation, he simply accepted the supposed objectivity of the machine and sent a man to prison for a crime that didn't warrant it. As it stands now, we just seem to be part of this enormous social experiment being run by tech gurus. And every year or so, another social experiment is added to the mix with its own unique set of social consequences. More recently, we're discovering what a rapid stream of bite-sized videos does to teenagers or what a completely user-generated game does to tweens. So far, this video has been pretty hard on the big tech companies, but I think it's also really important to acknowledge that they are trying to address some of these issues with algorithms. YouTube, for example, has changed its algorithm to include quality and authority as measures of determining whether a video is recommended or not. Facebook has limited its targeting options to try and avoid another Cambridge Analytical scandal where user data was distributed without consent for political purposes. Are these adjustments to the algorithm helping? Yes, but not as much as necessary. Even more is the fact that these efforts point to two things. One is that human intervention in algorithms is not only necessary, but needs a much stronger presence. Two is that tinkering with the algorithm is probably not going to resolve the consequences of their most significant bias, profit-seeking. Keeping people on a platform is always going to be easier with content that sparks the most outrage. That's not always the case, of course. There is great content on YouTube and earnest viewers like you watching this video right now. But for every creator seeking to share legitimate information, there seems to be several others blatantly exploiting the algorithm for a quick buck. How can we take these platforms back from them? The sad truth is, we can't. The algorithms need to change. They need to put human welfare above profits. We need to stop designing machines that take advantage of our psychological weaknesses. To make that world possible, we need to be more critical of the algorithm. We need to dismantle the notion that the algorithm is all-knowing, objective, and rational. The black boxes need to open up, and our blind trust in these systems needs to be challenged at every turn. To paraphrase the co-founder of the Center for Humane Technology, Tristan Harris, we're all looking out for the moment when technology would overpower human strength and intelligence. But there's a much earlier moment when technology overwhelms human weaknesses. That point is being crossed right now, and it's reducing our attention spans, ruining our relationships, destroying our communities. It's downgrading humans. Do you own the music that you listen to? If you collect vinyl records or just happen to still have CDs laying around, then you do. But the majority of us in 2023 rely on subscription services like Spotify or Apple Music to borrow the music we enjoy. What about the movies you watch? Well, thanks to the access we have to streaming services like Netflix, Hulu, and Amazon Prime, very few of us feel the need to own DVDs or VHS tapes anymore and have instead become borrowers of the movies we watch as well. You think these are just subscription models, but what about the games you buy from Steam, the PlayStation Store, or Xbox Store? Do you own those games? Or do you just own access to those games? If you own it, shouldn't you be able to resell, lease, or even borrow it to someone else? These are just a few examples of how big tech has created a business model that almost entirely erased personal ownership. And entertainment is just the beginning. In 2016, a member of the Global Future Councils wrote this, Welcome to 2030, I own nothing, have no privacy, and life has never been better. This satirical article talks about something called the sharing economy, and how society is moving towards the point where only a few people own everything, and the rest of us simply borrow to live. In it, Ida Alkin proposes that as digitalization and subscription services continue to grow, People will own fewer personal possessions and instead become more accustomed to renting from and sharing with others, essentially trading an ownership for convenience. In the future, people will rent my living room for meetings while I go to work, she writes. The invention of a rideshare service like Uber, Lyft, and Zipcar 
have made it easier than ever to not own a car. As a result, it's becoming increasingly more common for people to rely on the flexibility and convenience of these services rather than taking on the responsibility of becoming a vehicle owner themselves. For those who do go ahead to purchase their own vehicle, we've started to see car companies turn features that are supposed to come with a vehicle into subscription services. BMW recently received a lot of backlash when they quietly announced that they'll be blocking off features such as heated seats, heated steering wheels, automatic high beams, and adaptive cruise control, charging car owners a monthly fee to access features that should come with the car. Microtransactions like these are greedy and exploitative and keep the consumers tied to the companies even after a supposed transfer of ownership of a property. If I own the car, why do I still have to pay for some of its features? Features that should ideally come included with my purchase. Sadly, this is just the beginning of a slippery slope that will continue to chip away at the value of ownership. One of the main reasons why most of us don't see the immediate problem with the sharing economy is that sadly, we just don't have enough money to outrightly buy everything we need or even invest in our future. Some of you may be surprised to hear that we own less things now than we did decades ago. I know it sounds contradictory when news articles, TV shows, and YouTube videos tell us that we are at the pinnacle of a consumerism crisis. However, there has been some emerging research which suggests that actually, the peak of consumerism may have already passed. The Office of National Statistics ran a test in 2013 which showed that the average adult in the US owned 10.3 tons of personal possessions, a number which had dropped pretty significantly compared to the average 15.1 that was measured in 2001. But what exactly is so dangerous about living in a world that is slowly moving away from personal ownership and towards a sharing economy? Being an owner of a possession, whether it be something as large as a piece of property or as small as a DVD, provides us with a sense of personal and financial autonomy. Purchasing a home, for instance, is an investment, meaning that the money you pay towards the down payment and the mortgage of that home has the potential to come back to you in the future if you decide you want to sell the property. Even if you own a home that you have no intention of selling, the fact that it's yours still provides you with a personal sense of freedom, security, and sovereignty. Just knowing that if you run into any financial emergency, you can sell your house to solve that crisis gives you peace of mind. This example is most obvious when we talk about buying a home, but it extends all the way down to the ownership of every single material possession. The beauty of owning something, whether it's a property or a stainless steel pan, is that you can trade or sell it to recoup the money that it's worth. Looking back at the pieces of media we talked about in the beginning, when you bought a vinyl record, you could share it with a friend or sell it after you're done listening to it. Today, you can't even listen to your music without using a specific company's app or buying a game from the PlayStation Store and sell it to your friend once you're done playing. Right now, it might seem like trivial things, but imagine the world Ida Alkin paints in her article, where the average person doesn't even own their everyday household appliances because of how easy and accessible it is to rent and share them. If that futuristic world were to become our reality, wouldn't we all be a lot less in control of ourselves and the environment we live in? Wouldn't we all be simply floating through life, renting and borrowing things to get by? It's a scary thing to think about. Another concern that comes with the sharing economy, subscription services, and digitalization is the loss of personal privacy. Think about it, streaming services such as Netflix and Spotify have all your data. To use these platforms, you kind of have to grant them the permission to learn everything about you from your favorite kind of music to the movies you watch in the middle of the night when you're alone. Most of us are aware of these algorithms, but hardly ever consider them to be a compromise to our privacy because they're used in a way that helps make our experience on the platforms more enjoyable. But that's not all the data is being used for. Our information is constantly being sold to advertising companies to handcraft and deliver targeted ads to us, causing us to spend money we don't have on stuff we don't need. Furthermore, because you have provided these services with your name, phone number, email, home address, and credit card number, they have an enormous amount of access to your personal and financial information. With all that data being stored and tracked, it's no wonder that digital hacking is at an all-time high right now. The cost of being hacked rose nearly 15% in 2020, the highest year-over-year -year increase in IBM's data set history. This increase was partly due to hackers and cyber gangs capitalizing on the chaos of the pandemic, but part of the reason why they were so successful was also due to how much personal data is readily available on the internet and how much of our personal information we give out to these big tech companies. At some point we need to ask ourselves, should we really be paying for comfort and ease of use with our privacy? 
The biggest defense for subscription models is that they help us save on costs, where you would have had to pay around $10 for one album, for the same price every month you can have almost every song in existence. And yes, we can't deny the fact that subscription models give us access to way more things at a reduced cost, but the reality, as with most things, isn't that straightforward. Because these subscriptions are automatic, over time, costs can sneakily add up without the consumer being fully aware of how much they're actually spending. Let's use Netflix as an example. When you first sign up for Netflix, you're mystified by the possibility of having unlimited access to approximately 50,000 shows and movies for only $15 a month, a fee that adds up to $179 a year. However, in reality, no matter how intriguing the idea of having so many options seems, no singular person will ever likely have the time or ability to watch all 50,000 of those movies and shows. Let's say instead during that first year of being a Netflix subscriber, you end up watching 50 movies and shows. Although many would argue that paying $179 to enjoy 50 pieces of entertainment is still a great deal, as the cost of buying the physical copies of those 50 movies would have been far greater, there's still an underlying flaw in that equation. If you owned physical copies of those 50 movies or shows for the one-time fees you paid to buy them, you would have unlimited access to them for the rest of your life. Whereas within the confines of the subscription model, the second you stop paying the recurring monthly fee, your access is cut off completely. So in reality, the cost isn't $179 a year, but $179 a year for the rest of your life, including every single price increase. Because again, you're locked into that one company if they're the only ones who have the movie or show you want to enjoy. There are also several situations where a person has the desire to watch just one specific show or movie, but the only way they can do so is to sign up for an entire streaming service. Meaning that they'll pay roughly the same price to borrow that piece of entertainment as they could have to just own it outright and have unlimited access to it forever. And that is if they manage to sign up for and then cancel that subscription within the first month of their membership. It's been statistically proven that people chronically underestimate how much they're paying for streaming and subscription services. A survey commissioned by market research firm C R Research illuminated that 54% of people underestimated the amount that they spend monthly on subscriptions by at least $100 and 24% underestimated it by over $200. On average, consumers spend $133 a month and about $1,600 a year, more than they estimated that they did on streaming services. All of this goes to show that subscription fees can become a slippery slope for people as they recur passively, which allows them to easily fly under a customer's radar and build up over time. This problem of ownership is not only caused by subscription services, the rise of digital assets as opposed to physical ones are also reducing what it means to own something. The best example of this is software. When you buy software, what you're buying is digital access to it. This is why you can buy something, but you still don't have the right to resell or even lend it to someone else. The danger with this is that we leave all the control in the hands of the companies. If you buy something and you decide it wasn't right for you, your only option is to hold out hope that the company you got it from has a return policy. If not, you'll be stuck with something that you can't get rid of and money you can't regain. Furthermore, streaming services and online websites that sell pieces of intellectual property, such as movies or video games to consumers, always have the option to discontinue their ownership of that property, thus making the consumer's ownership of it obsolete as well. Imagine paying Netflix's subscription for years just to watch your favorite comfort show, and then one day they just announce that they'll be removing it from the platform and you can do nothing about it. For most of us, this isn't something we have to imagine, it's something that has happened time and time again. And this is the final and most painful thing about the digitization of everything. If these things only exist in digital form, when licenses expire or these companies simply don't see the need to host the content on their platforms anymore, they'll be gone forever, lost forever. If big tech completely destroys ownership and all we have is borrowed, and all we own is digital, what would be in the museums of the future? In June 2019, Kirsten Mullerval, a psychiatrist at Hanover Medical School and head of its Tourette's outpatient department, noticed unusual symptoms in her new set of patients. To begin with, all of them were teenagers, and they were suffering from sudden and uncontrollable tics. Even though none of them had any history of the condition, they were all shouting different kinds of obscenities. Mullerval consulted her tight-knit group of global Tourette researchers and found out that her newest patients were not unique. It seemed that a shift in patients and symptoms was happening all over the world, and what was even more surprising was that it was happening at the same time. 
But what really puzzled Mullerval was that most were repeatedly shouting the same phrase, you are ugly. As it turned out, this phrase was the key to understanding this strange spike in cases. Four months before the mysterious global outbreak, a 20-year-old German suffering from Tourette's named Jim Zimmerman launched a YouTube channel and a TikTok page detailing what it's like to live with his condition. He immediately became a social media sensation, gathering more than 2 million subscribers on YouTube and millions of views on TikTok, where he shows his viewers how his condition can force him to blurt obscene words or experience uncontrollable tics and convulsions. Zimmerman had the tendency to blurt out the phrase, you are ugly, one that he shared with all new style patients suddenly appearing all over the world. After making this connection, researchers found that all the patients who suddenly claimed to have tics were also fans of Zimmerman. When Mullerval confronted her distressed patients and told them that none of them actually had Tourette's, most of them recovered immediately. But despite their recoveries, this case presented researchers with an unprecedented psychological mystery showing how imagined symptoms can spread purely from TikTok videos. While these teenagers didn't suffer from Zimmerman's condition, something triggered their minds to believe that they did, and all of a sudden, all of them simultaneously and independently developed these TikTok tics. With TikTok becoming one of the most used social media apps today, it's becoming even more important to consider. Could TikTok be causing a mass psychosis? Mass psychogenic illness, or MPI, also known as mass sociogenic illness, is a real occurrence where a group of people starts feeling real physical symptoms at the same time, even though there's no physical or environmental reason for them to be sick. The dancing plagues of the Middle Ages were probably the most bizarre form of MPI. In July 1518, residents of the city Strasbourg were struck by an uncontrollable urge to dance. It started with one woman stepping into the street and dancing for nearly a week before she was joined by three dozen others who also seemed to have the same uncontrollable urge. The town then hired musicians to provide backing music, which only worsened the situation as more people joined in. It wasn't long before the marathon started to take its toll. By August, the dancing plague had 400 people in its clutches, with 100 of them dancing themselves to death. More recent but less dramatic cases include a boarding school in Mexico, where a student developed leg pain and paralysis. Soon after, hundreds of their schoolmates began experiencing the same symptoms. In East Africa, three girls who started laughing uncontrollably managed to infect over 100 other students, forcing their school to close down. The triggers for mass psychogenic illnesses cannot be entirely isolated, but they can't easily spread among people who share the same anxieties, fears, and sense of community. This is what makes the TikTok ticks an even more intriguing study. TikTok rapidly gained popularity during the pandemic as a trendy dance video and crazy challenge app. But since then, it has established itself as the world's most popular app, with nearly three times as many users as Twitter. A recent study even found that it has dethroned Google as the most popular domain in 2021, with most of its visitors using the app as a primary search and discovery platform. With over 1 billion active monthly users who spend an average of 95 minutes a day using the app, it has become more important than ever to understand what kind of effects TikTok has on our brains. While the effects of social media on our mental state have been a topic of debate for the past decade, the emergence of TikTok is different. It allows users to watch an unlimited stream of new content, observe trends rise and fall daily, and find something new with each swipe. Because the videos are often extremely short, the user can quickly decide whether to continue watching or move on to something more interesting. This constant stream of information can narrow and exhaust our attention span over time, limit our concentration, and affect our short-term memory. TikTok places a constant focus for content to be delivered in 60 seconds or less, making anything longer feel like it's a waste of our time. Some users have reported that they don't even have the patience to watch 10-minute videos on YouTube anymore, even when the topic interests them. This reduction in our attention spans can come from a variety of risk factors, such as poor academic performance, communication struggles, social isolation, relationship difficulties, stress, and anxiety. A recent study conducted by Curtin University in Australia has shown that the heavy use of social media can lead to problematic mental health consequences, especially for people with lower attention spans. Which brings us back to the TikTok ticks. This curious Tourette's case was the first form of social media-induced sociogenic illness. In addition to the teenagers in Germany, about 50 patients across the globe presented the same symptoms which demonstrates the domino effect of our social media landscape. Constant exposure can lead to low attention spans in those that never had the issue before. 
which can lead to psychological illnesses which can, in turn, spread imagined conditions around the world in a way that we never even dreamt of before the age of the internet. According to TikTok, videos tagged with the hashtag Tourette's have been viewed more than 5 billion times. The unexpected appeal of these videos among teenagers can be attributed to a need to stand out or be different. But the truth is, videos like these also provide a sense of community, acceptance, sympathy, and validation, which all seem to be present in patients suffering from MPI. Even though Zimmerman's intentions were to show his followers what it's like living with Tourette's, it also validated violating social conventions and gave proof to young, impressionable viewers that the more disruptive you are, the more viral you'll go. This is the basic concept behind TikTok. The whole idea is to promote videos that can go viral in an instant and push young content creators to produce similar content. That's why the first thing you see when you open the app is the For You page, where short videos that are carefully selected to grab your attention are displayed. It's why the video is on autoplay and shown in an endless scroll, and there's no signalization of progress or duration of the experience. All these features are intentionally designed to grab and keep the attention of young users for as long as possible, and urge them to create similar content if they want to get that attention for themselves. In a recent interview, comedian Andrew Scholz talked about how TikTok's algorithm promotes useless content in the West, but shows entirely different content centered around innovation, architecture, and science in China. Like Scholz, many argue that TikTok is intentionally making people dumb by manipulating user behavior and pushing mindless content on its impressionable young viewers. To that point, TikTok trends have included things like the blackout challenge, where children were tasked with holding their breath until they fainted, the penny challenge, encouraging kids to push pennies behind partially plugged phone chargers, which could have dangerous results, and the tooth file challenge, where young users were causing permanent damage to their teeth just for some of that desired attention. The more these videos went viral, the more content creators saw it as an opportunity to gain traction on the platform. This in itself feeds the vicious cycle of harmful content that leads to illnesses similar to the TikTok tics and other mental disorders. Today, TikTok is being looked at in a number of US states to determine its influence on its young users' mental health. According to Dr. David Barnhart, clinical mental health counselor at Behavioral Sciences of Alabama, all social media platforms impact how a person views themselves, but because of TikTok's rapid fire influx of content, users are exposed to dozens of videos within minutes which makes the effect much more devastating than other platforms. Users can easily become addicted to the app and may seek constant stimulation as a result. This constant stimulation increases stress and anxiety levels, especially with numerous videos that fuel body dissatisfaction, appearance-related anxiety, and much more. Mental health professionals have reported seeing a number of younger patients who spend considerable time on TikTok, claiming to have severe mental health conditions such as schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. And the main issue with such claims is that more exposure to targeted content can influence teenagers to misdiagnose themselves with a mental illness without consulting a professional, only because they can relate to some of the symptoms of a TikTok influencer they follow. Just like the TikTok Ticks case, young adults who self-diagnose can also do so from a desire to feel like they're part of a community, or to rebel against social constructs, and in the process, they can genuinely believe that they suffer from a specific illness, even when they don't. The flip side to all of this is that there are several positives that can come from highlighting mental health issues online. The sense of community which can be harmful in some cases can also be helpful in normalizing these conditions and sending the message that people aren't alone. Young people suffering from their own issues can come together and support each other with helpful tips on how to deal with depression, anxiety, and other hurdles in their daily life. Videos discussing mental health get millions of views on TikTok every day and draw people to symptoms that some people may not have realized were an issue. This can spur people into action and encourage them to seek help. As with all things, there are positives and negatives, which is why experts don't believe that deleting TikTok is the answer. Instead, regulating and monitoring the time spent on the app is key, otherwise the social media fueled mental health crisis is only going to get worse. The age of the internet has definitely brought out a whole new dimension of concerns that we should worry about, but TikTok itself has changed the online world. It's a cultural phenomenon with a superior algorithm that is unmatched by its social media rivals. It's built to ruthlessly and aggressively collect your data, and constantly feed you content that's for you. Content that could change the direction of your life, warp your perceptions of the world around you, and even cause mass psychogenic illnesses worldwide. MPIs have existed for hundreds of years, and yet a lot of the reasons why they happen remain a mystery. But what we can learn from the TikTok Ticks case is that we're now entering a new era of social media-induced sociogenic psychosis, 
and apps like TikTok have more control and power over our youth than we thought. The best predictor of future behavior is previous behavior, and based on what we already know, we've most likely not seen the last of social media induced psychological illnesses. For now, at least you had the patience to watch this entire video. Thanks for not swiping to check out the latest escalator dance clips or watch a guy deep cleaning a horse's hoof. A couple of weeks ago, I was having dinner with a friend and overheard what had to be a first date at the table right next to us. The conversation was awkward at first as they both seemed to struggle to get a good flow going. I looked over a bit later to see that they were now much more engaged in discussion. They shared their interests and had started looking each other in the eye more often. They even touched hands. Slowly, the pair of them seemed to grow affectionate towards each other. I went to the bathroom and the guy on the date walked in and used the urinal next to me. And to my greatest shock, right there on his phone was an open dating app. With his less busy hand, he was swiping left and right. Back at the table, he ended the date abruptly and called it a night. Just like that, he was moving on to the next option available to him at just the click of a button. Maybe I'm a bit out of touch, but what I witnessed seemed so cruel and callous that I asked myself, is that what dating is like now? Where we just swipe human beings left or right, discarding and approving potential mates on our quest to lasting romance, a one night stand, or something in between. Let's get one thing out of the way first. Dating sucks and has always sucked. Every date you go on, whether from an app or a more natural arrangement, you set yourself up for the strong likelihood of being disappointed or disappointing someone else. You might get your heart broken when your love is unrequited or have to tear someone's heart out when you're just not feeling it. You might say the wrong thing or your date might not even show up. These worries are the same now as they have been since romantic love became a thing in the 19th century. There's less emphasis on men needing to pick up their date in a hot rod and buy them dinner and drinks. And of course, gay and lesbian dates are more common, but otherwise, many of the worries are the same. Sadly though, there is something distinctly different and more sinister about the world of online dating. You may need to be older to remember, but online dating first became a thing in the mid-90s and was heavily stigmatized at the time. Using Match.com or Kiss.com was for people who couldn't handle the real world of dating. Culturally, it was seen as a sign of weakness. Just like everything else that came with the internet, online dating grew and the potential dangers grew with it. Meeting a stranger, especially alone, poses a risk. Dating apps pose a slightly aggravated risk because they tend to attract an outsized portion of psychopaths and love addicts, with one seeing you as a victim and the other as their savior. That's not to suggest that you'll end up at the bottom of a river if you go on a few online dates, but that, at the very least, you might have had a really bad experience or two. When services like eHarmony arrived, they made a stronger case for computer-based matching using more detailed information. The services required you to take a quiz and would then try to pair people up based on their compatibility. Then in 2012, everything changed when Tinder arrived on the scene. The premise was simple, once you opened the app, you were greeted with a multitude of options for a potential mate. A huge picture and a tiny description about them stared you right in the face. All you had to do was swipe right if you were interested, and left if you weren't. If two people swiped right on each other, bingo, they matched and they could start a conversation. Even with just this basic understanding of how dating apps work, it shows how much we've managed to turn people into a commodity. This swiping feature is much different than flipping through products on a carousel ad you might see on Facebook or Instagram, or sifting through the different brand names in the grocery store. Right, left, right, left. Is this really how we want to be viewed by others? Think about it, you're looking for someone to be intimate and vulnerable with, and we're presenting ourselves like a flavor of chips on a shelf. Realistically, how much can you expect from a relationship that starts out almost transactionally? The state of modern dating is the consequence of the system that we've created. Dating on these apps is now ruthless, with ghosting, no-shows, and hostile and inappropriate messaging being much more common. Meeting up with someone on a dating app is no different than trying to buy or sell something on Kijiji. If one of the parties loses interest, they typically just don't show up. No message, no courtesy call, they just move on. This is bad enough when you're trying to just buy a product, but much worse when the product is your time, attention, and emotions. When an app treats people like products on a shelf, this attitude rubs off on its users. You're not swiping right on a human being, you're swiping on a product, and if that product doesn't seem desirable anymore, you discard it. And these are the factors of dating apps before we've even considered how their algorithms factor in. 
Although Tinder insists it doesn't use the system anymore, many of the card-based dating apps use a desirability score, or ELO. The more you match with people you swipe right on, the more desirable you're considered. The app then pushes your profile to more people. This process has little to do with making a match. The goal is to keep people on the platform by dangling desirable individuals in front of them. The more attractive people you see, the more likely you are to feel hope that the one is out there and you won't delete the app. It's similar to how lotteries lure you in with bigger jackpots. Even though the odds are still next to impossible, the increasing pile of money keeps you hopeful when despair is the more appropriate response. When someone ranks higher, it doesn't make them more likely to be good in a relationship, it just means that people found them attractive based on the superficial criteria. Putting more of these people in your set of cards does nothing to increase your odds of finding love, it just increases the odds of you staying on the platform. Those with lower scores are shown less often, which gives them two options. Give up, or pay to have their profile boosted. This common feature among the apps exploits people who don't present well for profit. Being able to boost your profile just gets you back to a more level playing field that you shouldn't have been denied in the first place. Remember that these platforms are, above all else, money-making systems. As we discussed in our recent video on algorithms, the bias towards profit has consequences, and in the case of dating apps, those consequences may be the dire state of the dating landscape or your chances for lasting love. Maybe the most disastrous thing about dating apps is that we're ultimately commodifying love and that can change the way we view and experience it. When we're attracted to someone, our brain releases the chemical dopamine as a reward response. Online dating apps train us to constantly seek this dopamine hit from attraction or lust. Then when we're with someone, we're no longer getting that high of attraction, we know it can easily be found on an app in our pocket. All we have to do is ghost, deceive, or abruptly break up with someone in order to get it again. Even just looking at an attractive person on your app will give you a hit of dopamine making loyalty to a lover much less appealing. You get hooked into a reward cycle, it becomes addictive. Just as you get a blip of joy from a like on social media, you get a hit of dopamine from a match on Tinder. It keeps you coming back even if you've found someone worth keeping. Most of us have been with someone we loved and still question whether there was someone better out there. Apps like Tinder exploit this feeling. They overwhelm you with choice, making you feel like you're never making the right one. And so you move on, back to the phone, back to the dopamine hits so readily available. As you go on dates and start relationships, the app is always dangling that shinier object or human being right in front of you. Because it's so fast and easy to get a new shot of dopamine by simply opening the app on our phones, we don't give ourselves enough time to get to know a person. Once a date gets even slightly boring, we're off to the bathroom to find the next dopamine hit. The problem with this is that although we're spiking our brains full of dopamine, we aren't spending enough time in relationships for our brains to produce oxytocin, or those warm, cuddly feelings which are more common in long-term relationships or with close friends and family. Oxytocin helps reduce our blood pressure and cortisol levels, which help reduce stress. It also promotes growth and healing. If you've ever been in a long-term loving relationship, you know just how at peace you feel. How when you're with this person, everything feels alright with the world. Dating apps are weaning us off of this feeling. Now if those were the only problems with dating apps, then maybe the situation wouldn't be so dire, but sadly, there's more. Like most online interactions, dating apps are often devoid of the empathy and consideration you typically get in real-world interactions. Sure, there are bad experiences to be had at your workplace or school, and occasionally, someone will behave callously towards you in person, but these bad experiences are far more prevalent online, where people can hide behind their computer screens. The odd thing about this, though, is that even with all of their issues, dating apps seem to work. People do find long-lasting relationships on these platforms, and of course, people looking for hookups find that too. Meeting people in real life is hard, maybe harder these days than ever before. When you meet someone in real life and want to ask them on a date, you're taking a big risk, and we're all hyper aware of that risk, well, most of us. If you ask a colleague or a peer on a date, for example, you're more likely to face some level of scrutiny now, even if it's small. And if you ask for someone's number in a grocery store, well, maybe you become the weirdo people complain about on Twitter. Considering this, it's not hard to see why people want anonymity in their dating life. Still, these dating apps don't need to be set up algorithmically to encourage cruelty or gouge less desirable people for money. Instead, we should empathize getting to know someone before a date and caring about them as human beings first not just another item for sale at the nearby big box store.
To do that, though, we need to crack open the black box and fundamentally change how the algorithms that power these dating apps work. Nowadays, it seems to be a common theme amongst almost everyone to go out and shop our way to happiness. You know, just to take care of ourselves. After all, nothing says mental health like impulse buying that will dig us deeper into debt than we ever thought possible. Don't you feel that you're above this age-old system of enticing customers into buying more stuff? After all, we are in the age of minimalism and all that good stuff, right? How many times have you found yourself annoyed by an ad in the middle of something you were watching and promised to yourself that there was no way such an annoying interruption can actually convince you to buy something you don't even want? And then you go and buy it anyway. Well, if these things weren't working, we wouldn't see them be used forever. So clearly, there is a method to the madness. And you might be surprised by just how meticulous this method can be sometimes. Of course. You and I know some of the basic stuff, like placing commonly bought items at the end of a store so that customers have to walk through most of it and therefore be exposed to other products to get to the ones they really need. That's why they usually put milk in the back of the store. It's a common item that most people need, and so they're going to make you see as many items as possible before you get to what you need. Then there are buy one, get one free offers, which clearly boost revenue and make us buy more stuff in exchange for very marginal discounts. Exposure and billboard ads also do some of the marketing heavy lifting, but you already knew that. What you didn't know, however, is just how deeply our psyche is being studied to understand patterns and predict customers' choices well before the customer is aware of them themselves. This is neuromarketing. Well, it all starts with how humans perceive things. Humans, for whatever reason, perceive relatively and not absolutely. What this means is that our perception is based on stimulus that is already present. You can see this play out every day. For example, if someone near you unlocks their phone in a well-lit environment and lights up the screen, the change in brightness of your surroundings is barely noticeable. If you do the same thing in, say, a movie theater, it can sometimes be startlingly bright. Even though the brightness around you changed by the same amount in both cases, your perception of them is vastly different. Similarly. We also perceive loudness relatively. If you are already in a loud environment, the addition of another sound, say a glass breaking, may be barely noticeable. But in a quiet environment, even the same sound can feel much, much louder. Known more formally as Weber's Law, this idea of relative perception has been a core principle of astronomy and music theory alike since they both have something to do with how we humans perceive things. Well now, it has one more application and that has to do with our perception of price. Firstly, this means that whenever the price of a commodity either goes up or down, how a customer feels about that price change depends on the original price of the commodity. Companies can use this information to marginally keep increasing the price of a product over iterations, provided that they do so in increments that are just below our perception threshold. This applies more generally to markets around the world, where people also perceive the price of a commodity based on how much disposable income they have. This is the reason why some products that do very well in America, despite increases in price, don't work very well in countries like China. But it goes deeper than that. Disposable income and original prices have fairly obvious relevance in this topic. However, our minds can even be tricked by seemingly irrelevant numbers as well. Studies were conducted where participants were asked to gauge how much they would pay for a certain product. However, before they were allowed to make their minds up, they were asked to think of the last few digits of their social security number. It turned out that the participants with higher social security numbers were willing to price the item higher. Despite being in no way related to the commodity itself, this process, also known as anchoring, caused the participants to be more generous with their bids. In his book, Brainfluence, Author Roger Dooley hypothesizes that this may be the reason why counters, now commonly seen in fast food chains, are used. Beyond just letting the customer know when his or her order is ready, these counters, almost always counting large numbers, primes them to be okay with paying just that little bit more. A more common method of anchoring is also to state things like, normally you'd have to pay such and such for a product like this, but not with us. Sometimes. 
the anchoring is even more obvious. For example, do you remember how much the iPhone cost when it came out in 2007? It was over $499, and in some places even higher. That's a tall order, especially if you consider that it was for a product that many people were not really familiar with. Even in today's standards, with hardware that is orders of magnitude better, some phones, including Apple's own iPhones, are cheaper than that. So why did marketing genius Apple do such a thing? They possibly just used the demand curve to the best of their ability. First, set the price as high as you can, since every market has a certain percentage of people that can pay even the inflated prices assuming they like the product. Once you have exhausted that demographic, drop the prices significantly, which is exactly what Apple did. By the time the iPhone 3G came out, some retailers were selling it for as low as $199. By this point, there were enough people owning iPhones that people started familiarizing themselves with the product. And by dropping the price so much, Apple made it seem like they were giving the phone away on a massive discount. The initial $5 to $600 price was seemingly just an anchor that made the eventual price seem like a total steal. There is one more thing. You know how Apple always prices things a dollar less than the big number? Like $499 instead of just $500, and $999 instead of just $1000. Well, I used to think that when we pay $4.99 for something, we feel as though we are paying $400 and something, as opposed to just flat out $500. We feel closer to $400 than to $500. However, this is not entirely true. For things that are priced at whole numbers, our minds like to think that a fair price would also be a whole number increments below it, meaning something that has a list price of $20 probably registers as deserving $17 or $18. Meanwhile, if something is priced at $19.95, our brains think a deserving price would be $19.50 or $19.30. So despite the fact that $19.95 is lower than the $20 price tag, surprisingly enough, you would have much happier customers if you were to accept just a few less cents. A University of Florida study tested this idea where participants were asked to estimate the actual price of things put on auction. The three prices were $4,988. 5,000 and 5,012. Realistically speaking, they were all very close to each other. The group that was tasked with estimating the price of the $5,000 thing estimated the lowest prices of them all. Even the $5,012 group, at just $12, or 0.0024% more, were willing to pay more for the same item. It's all in your head, truly. Companies also sometimes place products that they know won't sell well just to make other products seem more desirable. Again, humans like relative improvements. Remember that. These marketing decoys help offers look much better than they actually are. In the book Predictably Irrational, the author Dan Ariely mentions an experiment where participants were offered two offer sets. The offers were as follows. Offer A included a $59 internet-only subscription, or a $125 internet and print subscription. Offer B also included a $59 internet-only subscription, but included both a $125 print subscription and a $125 internet and print subscription. In Offer B, it wouldn't make much sense to just choose the print subscription at $125 price point, when you could also get the internet subscription for essentially an extra $0. And this was clearly shown in the results. Want to guess which one generated the most revenue? The Offer B set generated nearly 45% more revenue compared to Offer A. The customers didn't choose anything they didn't choose before, namely the option to purchase the print-only subscription. But just its presence made the other two offers look much more desirable. Instead of competing with other companies using decoy products, Companies can essentially micro-compete within their own products and generate more revenue. It's all a game. Then there are smaller tricks that the companies employ on a regular basis. One is to slightly increase the font size of the products you want sold. The slight change is barely perceptible, but subconsciously, we register it as something more worthy of our attention. Another is to offer customers better, but not necessarily overwhelming, choices. This is where services like Amazon have truly cemented their position. Amazon has the resources not only to sell a lot of products, but also to organize them in the right way and only present to the customers what they're most likely to buy. 
Other companies can sometimes overwhelm the customer with too many flashy options, especially during Black Friday sales, which confuses them and makes the purchase seem that much harder to make. These are still things you and I can see and put our finger on. Companies go much further than that to make the customer feel safer to spend more. Olfactory association is one of the ways in which this is accomplished. Olfactory is the sensation of smell. According to some reports, as much as 75% of all our sensation has got to do with smell. It's no wonder then that the memories that have an olfactory component are held the strongest and are recalled much easier as well. The smell of McDonald's, for example, is something that the company puts as much effort into as anything you might see on the menu. There is a very good reason for it, of course. The feeling of familiarity is crucial to the brand of McDonald's, especially considering going to McDonald's is something that the company hopes to become a generational tradition. People go as children and eventually end up taking their own children to McDonald's. That there are reports that McDonald's infuse the smell with the cleaning liquid its staff uses to clean the store. A similar theme follows all major industries. We've all heard about the new car smell or the new sneaker smell. These are all essential elements of a company's effort to construct a recognizable image, one which we may not even see. Singapore Airlines, regularly voted as one of the best airlines in the world, also uses this marketing strategy. They are known to give passengers hot towels at the start of every flight. But even this seemingly innocent gesture is working to sew the brand image deeper and deeper into our minds. The company has its own brand fragrance, Stefan Floridian Waters, and it is infused into those hot towels that passengers use. Needless to say, the flight attendants are wearing it too, and so is the cabin interior. Of course, it can go both ways. Starbucks reportedly removed some of the sandwiches from its menu because they smelled too much like eggs and took away from the coffee-heavy Starbucks smell customers know and love. One may question whether doing these things is even ethical. Well, there are two sides of the coin, as with any debate. On the one hand, marketers might argue that using these techniques, they are better understanding what their customers want and giving them a better shopping experience. On the other hand, this opens us up for attention sabotage, something which has been happening rather frequently with social media platforms already. One thing is for certain though, we have far less control over our purchasing decisions than we thought. We buy things we don't need to impress people we don't like, and the things you own end up owning you. In 1946, a 41 year old hairdresser named Janet Stott came to Strong Memorial Hospital in Rochester, New York to be treated for scleroderma, a rare connective tissue condition. She had escaped the violence against Jews in Belarus during the Second World War and was hoping to begin a new life in the United States. What Stott didn't know was that she would become one of the 18 people the US government secretly injected with plutonium from 1945 to 1947 as part of the Manhattan Project. None of them ever found out. The Manhattan Project was the code name given to the American-led effort to research and build a functional atomic weapon during World War II. It recruited thousands of scientists worldwide and took place across multiple continents. The result of these efforts was the construction of the world's first ever atomic bombs, which were later dropped on the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, ultimately ending the Second World War. The mobilization for the program began in 1939 when the President of the United States, Franklin D. Roosevelt, received a startling letter from Albert Einstein with an urgent message. Physicists had discovered that uranium had the potential to generate unprecedented amounts of energy that could be used in creating the world's strongest and most devastating bomb. What was more urgent in Einstein's letter was that he suspected that Nazi Germany was already stockpiling this radioactive element in hopes of creating a weapon of mass destruction. After the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in December 1941, the United States joined the war alongside the Allied forces, and in 1942 the Manhattan Project was officially born, bringing forth an atomic revolution shrouded by secrecy, espionage, and a whole lot of controversy. While nuclear research had begun in the US before its involvement in the war, the Manhattan Project stood out because it wasn't purely theoretical. Its purpose was clear-cut, build an atomic bomb before the Germans. Within a year it became the number one priority during the war. It got all the funding, all the resources, and all of the green lights. The research was mainly centered around the fission of uranium-235 and plutonium-238, 
which split and release heat and atoms with smaller atomic numbers when enriched with an extra neutron. The project's goal was to produce a chain reaction from splitting these atoms to release enough energy to trigger an explosion. Despite its name, the Manhattan Project took place all over the US, Canada, England, the Belgian Congo, and parts of the South Pacific, but its most famous research facility was the Los Alamos National Laboratory, located in the remote mountains of northern New Mexico. As the war advanced and Nazi Germany faltered in Europe, the focus of the project turned to Japan. After the first atomic bomb, called the Gadget, was successfully tested around 240 kilometers, or 140 miles from Los Alamos, a uranium bomb called Little Boy and a plutonium bomb called Fat Man were dropped on the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. More than 200,000 people were killed instantly, almost all of them civilians. At its peak, the Manhattan Project employed 130,000 workers and by the end of the war, the US had spent $2.2 billion to produce Little Boy and Fat Man. While the research and development of the bombs is in itself controversial, especially with many scientists condemning it, there is another aspect of the program that is just as controversial, or even more so, is often forgotten. At that time, the project's personnel faced many issues handling recently discovered elements, such as plutonium, that had unknown health risks. So, without regard for human life and safety, the US government turned to human experimentation. The leaders of the Manhattan Project understood the urgency of measuring the impact of radiation on the human body, and in 1942, established a division whose purpose was to protect the health of workers and the public from radiation. They were also tasked with studying potential hazards to establish tolerance doses and develop methods of treatment. Ironically, the medical term of the Manhattan Project concluded that, in order to do all this, controlled human experiments were necessary. So between 1945 and 1947, 18 subjects were unwittingly injected with plutonium, several others were exposed to uranium, polonium, and americum. The experiments were conducted at the Manhattan Project affiliated hospitals all over the US, knowing that plutonium might be carcinogenic or even fatal to the unsuspecting subjects. Janet Schott never knew that plutonium was in her veins. The dose she was administered was 56 times the amount of radiation an average person absorbs in their lifetime. All of that straight into her veins all at once. Janet lived the remaining 29 years of her life in excruciating pain, suffering from a cancer that ultimately led to her death. Just like Stott, none of the other test subjects were informed of the substances they were being injected with, and in order to further understand the appalling nature of these experiments, it's important to highlight some of their stories. Eb Cade was the first victim. On March 24th, 1945, he was brought to the Army Hospital in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, after fracturing bones in a car accident. Dr. Heimer Friedel, one of the initial doctors assigned to the Manhattan Project, wrote to Dr. Louis Hempelman, the director of health at Los Alamos, that he found the primary subject for the first human plutonium experiment. He gave Cade the codename HP-12, with HP standing for human product. On April 10th, 1945, Cade was administered 4.7 micrograms of plutonium, which Friedel suspected was nearly five times the human body's limit. Samples of his teeth and a biopsy of his bones were taken shortly afterwards, and Cade was released. The doctors didn't expect him to live for more than 10 years, yet they did what they did with eyes wide open. Eight years after the injection, Cade died of heart failure. Similarly, Albert Stevens received a plutonium injection in California only a month after Cade. He was misdiagnosed with terminal stomach cancer, which later turned out to be just a benign ulcer. Stevens was never informed that he didn't have cancer, but was instead given a dose of plutonium-238. Doctors reportedly knew that the dose was potentially carcinogenic, but still administered it, which ultimately led to Stevens' death, also from heart failure. Just like Janet Stott, Ida Charlton, codename HP3, was also administered to Strong Memorial Hospital in Rochester in 1945. Three weeks later, she received a plutonium injection of 4.9 micrograms. Charlton was discharged in December, but she was regularly hospitalized after that until her death almost 40 years later by cardiac arrest as well. But perhaps the most questionable and horrendous case of all of that was of Simeon Shaw, a four-year-old suffering from terminal bone cancer. He was flown from Australia believing that he would be receiving the best available treatments for his condition. 
What he received instead was a death sentence in the form of a plutonium injection at California's UCSF hospital in 1946. What is most shocking about Shaw's case is that he was immediately flown to Australia afterwards with no follow-up on his case and no radioactive data collected. He died eight months later. The remaining human test subjects all share similar stories where they either died from the toxic effects of radiation or were impaired by lifelong illnesses. What's worse is that human experimentation was justified under the claim that all patients chosen were terminally ill, which simply wasn't true. A lot of those dosed were misdiagnosed, and repeated errors in procedure, research, and documentation were made, calling into question the efficacy of the experiments themselves. The Manhattan Project leaders claimed that these experiments were necessary to advance the science of nuclear physics. However, as we saw with the cases mentioned, the follow-up research wasn't thorough enough, and many of the samples ended up being contaminated or destroyed. So they basically ruined people's lives for absolutely nothing. Even after the Manhattan Project achieved its intended goal and World War II ended, human experimentation continued well into the Cold War. There's evidence of several large-scale projects all throughout the US that failed to inform their subjects of the health hazard of their experiments. One of the most shocking was intentionally exposing a school for disabled and special needs children in Massachusetts to radioactive iron and calcium in a government-sponsored study. Between 1953 and 1957, uranium injection experiments were also conducted on another 11 patients at Massachusetts General Hospital. Scientists concluded that uranium localized in the kidneys at a much higher rate than previously thought. Sadly, despite the experiment's results and the human lives lost, the occupational standards for uranium didn't change, making these human sacrifices unjustified and unnecessary. In the early 1990s, the Albuquerque Tribune exposed the nature of the experiments and the identities of the test subjects. All of them had already died, not knowing that they were dosed by the doctors that they trusted to cure them. J. Robert Oppenheimer, the Los Alamos Laboratory director and the scientist aptly dubbed the father of the atomic bomb, reportedly knew the nature of these experiments, but expressed that he didn't want them conducted in his laboratory. There is even evidence that he personally approved plutonium and uranium shipments to be used for human experimentation. The secrecy that revolved around the project makes it difficult to trace the chain of command, but there is enough evidence to show that all the health and medical directors of the Manhattan program were somehow invested in this research. They knew what was underway, with many even cheering it on. The families of the victims were eventually compensated by the government, and a total of $4.8 million was paid in damages, a little more than $9 million today. The US government also adopted new laws in 1997, preventing secret scientific testing on humans. Janice Jot's nephew said that the money didn't help his family get over the issue. His aunt left Belarus to avoid persecution, and came to America only to be injected with a radioactive element that would ruin the rest of her life and lead her to her grave. Today, the Manhattan Project is heralded by U.S. officials for the crucial role it played in ending the Second World War, but the controversy that surrounds it is still prevalent. The Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs leveled two cities in a matter of seconds, wiping out entire populations, and the testing that led up to those events resulted in early death or lifelong pain for over a dozen unsuspecting civilians. As with all wars, the innocent ended up paying the heftiest price. Many also argue that the success in developing the first atomic bombs led to the age of the Cold War and the race towards the development of nuclear weapons that are now a threat to humanity. After sending Roosevelt his urgent letter, Einstein later came to regret his decisions. Had I known that the Germans would not succeed in developing an atomic bomb, I would have done nothing, he famously said. When testing the gadget right outside Los Alamos, Oppenheimer quoted Hindu scripture foreseeing the immediate threat of nuclear weapons across the planet. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. One week later, the first atomic bombs were dropped, and the world as we know it changed forever. But was the pseudo-peace that existed following the Second World War worth the human sacrifice? Why do we love being scared? Is it the way our parts pound in our chests? The mixture of curiosity and revulsion when we see a monster or a ghost? Or is it something even darker? Like the disturbing themes portrayed in popular culture, are we drawn to genres like horror because we recognize them as a shadowy reflection of ourselves? 
Since primitive humans first gathered around campfires to tell stories, we've been trying to scare each other. In 2021, historians at the British Museum identified the world's oldest drawing of a ghost. Carved into an ancient Babylonian clay tablet dating back 3500 years, it lays out specific instructions for getting rid of unwanted spirits. Early mythologies are filled with these kinds of terrifying creatures. Often, these monsters were intent on punishing humans for some perceived misdeed. The story of Medusa tells of a woman who turned men into stone in retribution for her own defilement. African legends speak of creatures called Impundulu, vampiric lightning birds that summon storms and steal unprotected children. The oni of Japanese myth are terrible, flesh-eating trolls who often bring about disease or calamity. Many of these early horror stories are rooted in folklore and function as cautionary tales. They are meant either to deter or encourage particular behaviors. Abuse and murder will result in a vengeful haunting by a poltergeist. Honoring an ancestor's grave will keep their soul at peace. Even as society has moved on from using these legends as guidance, the need for horror still remains. Our modern idea of horror emerged in the 18th and 19th centuries with the rise of gothic literature. Novels like Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and Dracula by Bram Stoker paved the way for a new genre devoted solely to terror. Unlike older folktales which primarily served as moral lessons, these stories were written with the explicit intention of frightening their audiences. They incorporated dark, claustrophobic environments characterized by fear, decay, and the constant threat of the supernatural. Gothic literature set itself apart with an intense focus on how the present is always haunted by the past. More than two centuries later, modern audiences still love to be scared. We spend hours on YouTube watching creepy videos, gather outside of haunted houses hoping to run out screaming, and flock to theaters to see the latest horror flick. It's no surprise that John Krasinski's A Quiet Place Part 2 earned nearly 300 million worldwide at the box office. But of course, there's no better testament to horror's popularity than Halloween, an entire holiday celebrating all the things that make our spines tingle. The same year that A Quiet Place Part 2 broke pandemic era opening weekend box office records, it's estimated that Halloween spending hit an all-time high, surpassing $10 billion. So why do we like being scared? To answer this question, we need to understand the nature of fear itself. In a basic sense, fear is an evolutionary adaptation that allows us to rapidly identify and react to physical danger to increase our chances of survival. On a neurological level, it engages our amygdala, also known as the fear center of the brain. This cluster of neurons essentially functions as an alarm bell, controlling our emotional responses and creating feelings of anxiety, aggression, and fear in reaction to perceived threats. Other parts of the brain involved in rapid decision making and the encoding of long-term memories come online during this process as well. These not only help us to quickly respond to a situation, but to also clearly remember the incident later. That way, if we ever find ourselves in similar circumstances, we know how to react. For example, if shouting and making a lot of noise is able to scare off a lion that has been stalking you, the next time you run into one, you'll remember to do the same thing. This is why generally, the more emotionally intense an experience is, the better we remember it. It's how our brains learn what to seek out and what to avoid. This applies not only to moments of intense joy such as a graduation or surprise party, but also potentially frightening experiences like riding a roller coaster. Although scary at the same time, in hindsight these events can actually be remembered as incredibly fun and pleasurable. This reframing makes us want to seek out and repeat these experiences again and again. Another reason we may like being scared is because it releases a host of chemicals that our bodies naturally crave. Fear activates what's known as our sympathetic nervous system, a complex network of nerves that controls some of the body's unconscious actions. When triggered, the system initiates an intricate physiological process known commonly as the fight or flight response. If you've ever experienced sweaty palms, shortness of breath, increased heart rate, and a sinking sensation in your stomach, then you know what this feels like. During fight or flight, the body is flooded with a complex chemical cocktail that includes everything from adrenaline and endorphins to serotonin and even oxytocin. This particular recipe helps maximize our chances for survival by initiating various physical responses, such as blood moving from the extremities to larger muscle groups where they're actually needed. Interestingly, every one of these chemicals is also associated with other more traditionally pleasant emotions like happiness, surprise, and excitement. So, what on the surface may appear like an undesirable experience can actually turn out to be extremely enjoyable. It makes sense, then, why people with particularly efficient neurological reward systems tend to like being scared more. 
the thrill of a slasher film produces an immediate pleasurable rush of adrenaline, much in the same way as skydiving. It's important to understand, though, that there's such a thing as too much fear. If something is terrifying enough, it can trigger the development of phobias, an extreme and irrational fear of a particular object or situation. If experienced repeatedly over long enough time periods, it can lead to depression and post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. But when encountered in a safe, positive setting, fear can actually be fun. Think about it like this. Almost drowning in the ocean when you were a child? Bad. Watching Jaws and jumping out of your seat when the shark eats the late night skinny dipper at the beginning of the film? Good. There's also another reason why we're drawn to horror. Perfectly summed up in a statement by celebrated author and professional boogeyman Stephen King, we make up horrors to help us cope with the real ones. And he's right. A 2021 study found that horror fans fared much better psychologically during the first few months of the COVID-19 pandemic than those who said they didn't like being scared. It's speculated that people who regularly expose themselves to terrifying situations, even fictional ones, may be better at regulating fear. Because the more time spent in this heightened emotional state, the more desensitized the brain becomes, reducing its instinctual responses in favor of rational decision making. Therapists use this all the time in exposure therapy, a treatment specifically designed for anxiety conditions including obsessive compulsive disorder, PTSD, and various phobias. It works by retraining the amygdala through repeated activation. By encountering a feared object or situation over and over, the severity of the brain's response is lessened over time. Think of it like exercise. The first time you go to the gym, your body's going to be extremely sore and achy afterwards. But with each repeated visit, your soreness decreases. Your muscles become accustomed to the stress. The same goes for your brain and fear. As the brain recognizes that the threat no longer exists or wasn't even real in the first place, it transitions from its fight or flight response to a state of rest. This shift creates feelings of relief and euphoria that can alleviate anxiety and even boost self-confidence. Over time, exposure therapy moves the patient's neurological reaction away from the amygdala back to parts of the brain that control higher cognition. This reduces the intensity of instinctual gut reactions, allowing for complex planning and logical decision making. For example, if someone's afraid of sharks, Therapists will have the patient think about sharks, visit an aquarium, or even go deep sea diving with the help of virtual reality. With every repeated exposure, their fear response decreases, eventually causing it to recede. Horror has been shown to be similarly effective at doing this. The formula of suspense and resolution common to the genre mimics the exact neurological process one goes through when encountering a fear-inducing stimulus. This could be why some people who suffer from anxiety disorders really enjoy horror. Trauma survivors and victims of abuse in particular might even benefit from it. The internet is filled with anecdotal accounts of people with PTSD and generalized anxiety, feeling a sense of relief and calm after watching a scary movie or walking through a haunted house. Aside from relief, this attraction to horror may also have something to do with a phenomenon known as repetition compulsion the tendency for trauma survivors to seek out similar situations. Humans find comfort in what's familiar and predictable even when it's actively harmful to us. This can look like a person returning to a toxic relationship, or a war veteran watching footage of the battle in which they were wounded. It's the classic, the devil you know is better than the angel you don't. Potential reasons for this behavior range from low self-esteem to an aversion to change, but one explanation is that the brain is attempting to achieve a form of mastery over the situation. We never want to feel powerless again, so we repeatedly enter the same scenarios to hopefully gain control over them. And as it turns out, control plays a big part in regulating fear. A 2018 study found many people enjoyed scary movies exactly because they created these feelings of mastery and control. Horror, then, can be incredibly beneficial for trauma survivors by allowing them to delve into a world that is alien but familiar at the same time, without re-entering the same toxic situations in real life. This creates an avenue for recontextualizing traumatic experiences in a safer environment. It's a form of exposure therapy, a continual process of confrontation, coping, and relief. This may actually account for 2021's rapid uptick in Halloween-related sales and the success of recent horror films like A Quiet Place Part 2. We now have an entire population looking for ways to cope with having lived through a global pandemic and hoping they'll be in better control if history ever repeats itself. But what happens when we don't face our fears, or when we try to hide the parts of ourselves that we'd rather not think about? 
20th century psychologist Carl Jung proposed that every human mind contains a shadow, an unconscious aspect of our personalities that doesn't conform to the picture we have of ourselves in our heads. It's an emotional blind spot, a personification of everything a person refuses to acknowledge about themselves. An unconventional interest might invite mockery. Preferences in sexuality could result in social rejection or even physical harm. A traumatic life experience in your past might make others look at you differently. So instead of expressing these parts of ourselves, we repress them, burying them deep beneath the surface. Yet at our core, we still naturally seek out these parts of ourselves because the mind craves integration, the process of assimilating various elements of our personalities into our concept of self. We don't want to see ourselves as a disparate collection of divided pieces forever at war, but as a unified whole. If a person fails to do this, the shadow threatens to overtake their personality, coming out in malevolent and often violent ways. This is the situation best represented in the novel The Strange Case of Dr. Yeckel and Mr. Hyde, where a scientist literally transforms himself in order to indulge in vices minus the consequences. Is it any wonder then that gothic literature first took off during the Victorian era, a period defined by intense societal repression, or that its defining theme involves the past returning to haunt the present? Stories act as gateways into our unconscious urges and desires, allowing us to safely explore them. For some, this may be vicariously living out an unspoken fantasy. For others, it can be an opportunity to confront past traumas and hopefully grow beyond them. By its nature, horror includes an element of evil often personified by figures like Dracula, Leatherface, and Hannibal Lecter. It's this evil that must be defeated. In the same way, horror forces us to confront our shadows. It challenges us to grow and begin a process towards becoming stronger and more confident individuals. At its core, Fear is a survival mechanism. It's meant to help us overcome threats and keep us alive. From a psychological perspective, the most effective way to do this isn't to fight or run from the parts of our personality or our past that we don't like, but instead to incorporate them into ourselves. By doing this, we create the fittest, most robust individual possible. Horror, then, is about completeness. It's about feeling whole. Some love it for the thrills, the spectacle of blood and gore, Others use it as an outlet to deal with and overcome a prior negative event, recontextualizing it and regaining some form of control. But for all of us, horror represents an opportunity to confront our fears. Only by doing this can we come to understand the ghosts of our past and hopefully accept the darker parts of ourselves. Once upon a time, there was a wild pig and a sea cow. The two were best friends who enjoyed racing against each other. One day, the sea cow got injured and couldn't race any longer, so the wild pig carried him down to the sea where they could race forever, one on land and the other in the water. If you were born into the hunter-gatherer Aita community in the Philippines, you would have grown up listening to this story, and indeed no matter where you grew up in the world, most of us heard stories that echoed sentiments like this. While they may seem like mere fables on the surface, there's a lot to learn from them. Things like friendship, cooperation, and equality. In the past, stories like these permeated our culture from childhood to old age. But the world has changed a lot since our hunter-gatherer days. Stories that teach us about our sense of community are now limited to children's fables and no longer circulate through our culture as we get older. While in the past the job of passing on necessary life skills, history, and information was a collective effort, today, all of that power has been given to commercial media. In the words of George Gerbner, commercial media has eclipsed religion, art, oral traditions, and the family as the great storytelling engine of our time, and whoever tells the stories of culture gets to govern human behavior. And therein lies the biggest problem with commercial storytelling. Twitter, YouTube, TikTok, Facebook, all the different news apps and websites, how many times do we check the news on our phones every day? In the past, it took weeks, months, or even years to hear bad news from the other side of the world. But today, we have everything at our fingertips. Wars, riots, chaos, scandals. The news feels inescapable. It's like we're trapped in a constant reel of negative information on all platforms and from every news outlet. If you strip it down to its roots, the message behind it all is always the same. One that plays on our emotions and instills fear in our hearts, warning us against a world filled with people who want to hurt us ideologies that threaten ours, and unexpected events that are meant to keep us on high alert. But is the world really as bad as mass media wants us to believe? 
or are we suffering from mean world syndrome? In the 1970s, Dr. George Gerbner first coined the term mean world syndrome while conducting research on the effects of violent related content on our view of the world. His findings showed that a heavy diet of violence, whether through entertainment or the news, can lead to a sort of cognitive bias that makes us perceive the world as more dangerous than it actually is. What is the most interesting about Gerdner's research is that it doesn't matter whether we know the content we're consuming is factual, like a news report, or fictional, like a movie, the effect is the same. When we're constantly bombarded with negative information, we begin to develop a worldview that is highly skeptical, suspicious, and pessimistic. As part of this study, Gerbner estimated that the average American child will have watched over 8,000 murders on television before the age of 12. Consider the fact that Gerbner conducted his research in the 1970s, when the media's influence and its reach were substantially smaller, and you can imagine just how bad it must have gotten. How many murders, both real and fictional, do you think a child would have read, seen, or heard about in the media before the age of 12? 8,000 or 8 million? If that was the only problem with the media, then perhaps it won't be that horrible. After all, if bad things are happening, they need to be reported, right? Well, yes, but Gerbner said something while testifying before a US Congressional Subcommittee in 1981 that will send chills down your spine. Fearful people are more dependent, more easily manipulated and controlled, more susceptible to deceptively simple, strong, tough, and hardline measures. Could it be that the media is designed to serve people the worst news to instill fear in us so we can be more easily controlled by the powers that be? This point becomes even more plausible when you consider the fact that 90% of the media in the United States is controlled by just six corporations. This means that roughly 232 media executives are calling the shots on the vast majority of the news being presented to Americans, which is then passed on across the globe. Let's say the situation isn't as sinister as that and we aren't being subversely controlled by some criminal masterminds. At the very least, CNN, Fox, and all the other outlets want one thing. Our attention, and some of them will do anything to get it. People are more likely to pay attention to and remember negatives. Media outlets know this, which is why you'll find more negative news than positive news in your feeds. It's polarizing, engaging, and keeps us glued to our screens which in turn results in more revenue for advertisers who are literally paying for our attention. And once we start paying attention, the algorithms of social media take over and all of a sudden we're constantly being fed news that confirms our beliefs and further solidifies our already skewed worldviews. It's no secret that controversial content, the content that triggers an emotional response, is the content that performs best, gets shared most, and circulates longest. So whether we like it or not, we become bombarded with an endless scroll of polarizing content that only manages to make us even more skeptical about the world around us and suspicious of anyone who does not happen to share the same exact beliefs. This kind of reporting and these stories that we propagate throughout our society end up dividing us instead of bringing us together like the stories of old did. The sad reality is that whether the world is getting worse or not, the media will almost always make us think that it is, simply because it's good for business. Wow. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. So we've got our deadly disease. No, we just have to blame it on something that's in every household, something that people are a little bit afraid of already. The truth, which should be an unbiased representation of facts, is no longer at the core of news reporting. The story has become much more important, and stories that elicit negative emotions often get more eyeballs, reactions, and ad revenue. As a result, the problems that are constantly depicted in movies, news outlets, and on social media are relentlessly overstated to the point where we might feel it's even hopeless to do anything about them. What's worse is that this constant exposure to negative information that is relentlessly pushed on us by these obsessive algorithms can confuse the brain such that it becomes almost impossible to differentiate between exciting fact and thrilling fiction. A study conducted by three MIT scholars in 2018 found that false news spreads on Twitter substantially faster, farther, and deeper than the truth. The research also found that this misinformation wasn't spread through bots, but by actual human users, like you and I, retweeting. Just like these algorithms, our brains recognize that the most polarizing information, whether true or not, is the information that will go viral and elicit the most emotional response from the public. And so we hit share or quote in hopes of getting that viral tweet, without first verifying if the information we're spreading is accurate. Another reason why it seems like the world is substantially worse than what we see in front of us is that the news talks about things that did happen and not things that didn't. We don't hear about wars that never started due to successful peace talks or shootings that were prevented through proper policing. 
we barely hear when unemployment rates go down and when the economy is experiencing a turn for the better. Because again, it's just not as exciting as bad news. Sadly, as long as terrible things keep happening on the face of this planet, there will always be enough negative reports to fill the news, especially with smartphones now allowing people to become amateur reporters and crime investigators. The mean world syndrome speaks directly to our most innate fears, which then trigger our fight or flight instinct. When we watch a reporter covering a war zone, a shooting in a residential area, or a terrorist threat, our body naturally becomes flooded with hormones and chemicals designed to keep us on full alert in order to save us from the mean and bad world. While these survival characteristics were essential in our hunter-gatherer days, today all they manage to do is lead to anxiety, stress, and even trauma. But the world isn't as bad as we think it is, only the stories are. This is why to combat mean world syndrome, we have to take back control of how we're thinking, feeling, and reacting to the constant stream of negative or violent news being depicted all around us. The truth is that the world today is much better than it has ever been. Don't get me wrong, humanity is far from perfect. There are still conflicts in many places around the world, human rights issues we need to tackle, climate change problems we need to fix. But the world has never been as good as it currently is, at least for most of us. Advancements in healthcare and technology have increased our lifespans, decreased morality rates, and improved our living standards. We haven't witnessed any world wars for decades, we've grown more tolerant of each other and more accepting of our differences. Violence has steadily been on the decline since 1946, there have been fewer famine deaths in the past decade than any other time in human history, and extreme poverty has been declining literally by the second. Yes, we face harsh realities on our personal and global scale every single day, but when tragedy, crime, and war are presented as the norm and not the outliers, it's only natural for us to feel angry and afraid. We have to choose our information sources carefully, and not let the obsessive algorithms of social media dominate our perception of the world. We have to be conscious of our approach to news and entertainment and challenge the way we think. The next time you're scrolling through your feed and find a disturbing news report, ask yourself, is this fact or fiction? What real evidence is there of this occurrence? What's the context? Or am I just being manipulated so that I'll develop certain feelings of fear and suspicion? If you find your social media platform serving you the same kind of content, be conscious of this and make sure you diversify your newsfeed to include positivity to balance out the negativity. At the end of the day, we're a storytelling species and if we've learned anything from our history, it's that the narrative we share with one another is the most important thing. Just like in our hunter-gatherer days, the tales we're telling now will have a great influence in shaping our culture and our people. It might be time that we go back to telling stories like the wild pig and the sea cow. Maybe, if we do, we can cultivate the values that truly make us human, like caring for one another, being compassionate, and giving people the benefit of the doubt. The world is not as mean as the media wants you to believe. It's time we stopped letting them lie to us that it is. Four to six weeks. It's a duration of time that you and I probably take for granted. What can really happen in that time? Nothing, right? Maybe that's a big project at work, or maybe how long you'd spend learning integrals in calculus. In a different perspective, that is precisely the duration of time that Chinese, Korean, Mongolian, and Russian people in regions around Northeast China had after they were picked up by the Imperial Japanese Army for no apparent reason in the mid-1930s to mid-1940s. If only they knew what they were actually being picked up for was to be shipped off to a place called Harbin, a district in Manchuria of Japan at the time. The compound they were headed to had the rather innocent name, Army Epidemic Prevention Research Laboratory. The place they were actually headed to had no epidemic prevention lab. This was nothing good willed at all. Far from it. Right when they got into that windowless van, their identities had changed from whoever they were to a number, a few digits, a specimen. And as soon as they got off, well, they would never see their loved ones again. And thus ensued some of the most gruesome human experiments ever to have occurred in the name of war, or worse yet, science. But the human body, well, it can only endure so much. Nobody who was shipped off to this place lived for more than four to six weeks after being taken. Four to six weeks. This is the story of Unit 731.
The unit was built as a hub for chemical warfare research, inspired by the Nazis and their use of chemical weapons. Surgeon General of the Imperial Japanese Army, Shiro Ishii, had taken a few trips abroad, which had sowed the idea into his demented head before finally bringing it to the attention with a secret group of high-ranking Japanese officials. Initially scattered across different parts of Japan, the unit finally came together under one roof that would finally get the name of the Epidemic Prevention Center. People were seemingly picked at random from Chinese streets. There were men of all ages, women, and even babies. While the overwhelming majority of the victims of Unit 731 were Chinese, they also comprised Koreans, Mongolians, Russians, and some Westerners as well. Basically, anyone they could get their hands on. After the initial shock that most of the prisoners had suffered from being brought into such a place, surprisingly, they were actually fed quite well for the first few days. Don't mistake this as a gesture of kindness. In the minds of Shiro Ishii, this wasn't anything remotely close to that. It was simply to ensure that his precious test subjects were in an ideal state of health before the experiments began. The element of deception was interwoven into every facet of Unit 731, and it began with their very first meal on the very first day. In fact, Unit 731 couldn't care less about its victims beyond their usefulness for their research. Most notably, they weren't even referred to as humans, or even subjects. Within the unit staff, they were simply Maruta, or logs. The dehumanization began at the gate. When the grace period, or so to speak, was finally over, the experimentation could begin. This includes everything from infecting people with the bubonic plague, syphilis, to amputating limbs from one side of the body and reattaching them on the other, simply to see what would happen. Other tests included testing the methods to treat shrapnel wounds by first tying people to a post and then detonating an explosive in close proximity. In the movie Unit 731, Nights in Manchuria, it was said, To determine the best course of treatment for varying degrees of shrapnel wounds sustained on the field by Japanese soldiers, Chinese prisoners were exposed to direct bomb blasts. They were strapped, unprotected, to wooden planks that were staked into the ground at increasing distances around a bomb that was then detonated. It was surgery for most, autopsies for the rest. It is to be noted that none of these surgeries or experimentations were done under anesthesia. In typical demented Shiro Ishii fashion, the reasoning for this was that they weren't sure if the anesthesia would have a co-founding effect on the wounds or how they healed. After the initial bouts of screams, most of the victims just laid there, waiting to bleed to death. There are other numerous accounts of vivisections, or experimentation on live humans. It was so routine that they would go through the numerous bodies just for practice. Then there was the fascination with infectious diseases and their wartime applications. People would be infected left, right, and center with venereal diseases, and would then be forced to transmit those diseases amongst the other prisoners around. Babies were also said to have been born during the Unit 731 experiments, but I think you and I both know that many of them never got to see the light of day. Another relatively more known experiment of Unit 731 was the test conducted to treat frostbite. Given the possibility of a war with the Soviets, the Japanese army wanted to know how their soldiers would fare in the sub-zero temperatures in the event of frostbite and how best to treat them. To do so, however, they would first artificially induce frostbite in people by taking them outside in the freezing cold and splashing water onto their tied hands until they froze. Guards would then strike their arms literally to see what sound they made. If they sounded like wood, they knew they had frostbite. The victims would then be brought in for a plethora of treatments to try on them. Sometimes their limbs would be submerged in the liquids at well over boiling temperatures. A similar slew of experiments followed for extreme heat. They conducted experiments where participants would be forced to stay inside rooms with temperatures nearing boiling point, all to see how long a human could survive and how quickly the water in their bodies would evaporate. Then there were experiments to see how humans would fare against different chemical agents, in case it wasn't already clear from the Nazis. The lab was just the major military establishment to house all of this. That is not to say that the unit did not have a presence elsewhere. In fact, Unit 731 is said to have had branches as far as Singapore and Beijing. Besides, 
Viruses and bacteria developed within the facilities of Unit 731 were then tested in parts of China as well. Troops from the unit were said to offer candies laced with anthrax to kids in China, all while guising it as an act of kindness. They would also offer injections of infectious diseases in the name of preventative vaccinations. At the same time, they managed to create flies to spread the bubonic plague. Low flying planes carrying buckets of these flies would drop them into parts of China. And just days later, people would start perishing before the eyes of their loved ones for no apparent reason. They would also infect agriculture and water systems of these cities to examine how much of the population it would affect. Just these acts alone are said to have taken 400,000 Chinese lives. The biological warfare unit was so prolific that the logs would report bacteria quantities in kilograms, not grams, which is how it's used in pretty much every other biolab in the world. That should give you a sense of the scale at which they were operating. Reports suggest that the biological ammunition that Unit 731 possessed in its heyday was enough to destroy our current world's population many times over. A single death is a tragedy. A million is a statistic. It's a quote that's been used a lot in the past 18 months due to the pandemic. In Unit 731's case, one could make a similar argument. To Shiro Ishii, even a million lives wouldn't have truly registered. What mattered was how much data he had, and how much more he needed. This operation of the Imperial Army was so massive that they simply had lost all sense of value for human life that wasn't their own. In their own twisted way, the staff of Unit 731 justified their activities to their conscience by saying that they would have killed people in the battlefield anyways, so they might as well do it in the name of science. But even that wasn't entirely true. It was noted that a lot of the experiments the people in the unit were doing had no seeming scientific benefit. For example, they were injecting victims with blood from monkeys just to see how they would react. A professor at Osaka University who studied the unit's activities including watching footage had the following to say. Some of the experiments had nothing to do with advancing the capability of germ warfare, or of medicine. There is such a thing as professional curiosity. What would happen if we did such and such? What medical purpose was served by performing and studying beheadings? None at all. That was just playing around. Professional people too, like to play. They were simply doing them to soothe the demented impulse in them that one may call curiosity. These were psychopaths with power unlike anything they had ever experienced. Every rule has an exception. You know how people always say curiosity should know no bounds? Well, this is that exception. Of course, these are just some of the experiments. The truth is, some of the details are just so gruesome that I decided to not even mention them. Even the ones I mentioned are probably enough for this video to get restricted. And that's okay, because this is a discussion worth having. These and other experiments have taken the lives of hundreds of thousands of people. Lower bound estimates of the death toll from Unit 731 and its activities are somewhere around half a million. Now, I'm not one to compare atrocities, but it does seem a bit odd to me that people know about the Guantanamo Bays of the world, but not about Unit 731. Of course, that was until I found out that it's no accident that that's the case. Once Japan's surrender was imminent, the United States wanted full access to research documents of Unit 731. They even threatened the Japanese with involving the Soviets in their trial which would complicate things for Shiro Ishii and his staff, given many of Unit 731's victims were Russians. They were fearful of a trial under the war crimes law under the Soviets, and decided to strike a deal for complete immunity from all charges in exchange for the documents with the United States. The United States, on the other hand, wanted to ensure that these documents did not find their own to either their adversaries or even their allies. And in a singular bid to get the documents, they accepted the deal. Because of this, most members of Unit 731 were allowed to walk out and live their lives to their natural deaths scot-free, and some were even paid hefty sums along with their immunity for the documents. These people were literally paid for doing all of these terrible things to their fellow human beings, and this is probably the first time you're hearing of it. 
the United States maintains official silence over the unit to this day, and dismiss some of the early claims about the unit as communist propaganda. Many of the unit staff opened clinics later in life and went on to have very successful careers. Justice was certainly not served. Now, whether what the United States did was right or wrong, I'll let you decide. But what they essentially said to the rest of the world is this. The United States of America is ready to overlook even the most horrific violations of human rights if it is advantageous to do so. It is only relatively recently that the Japanese government even acknowledged the existence of this unit. Because of the deal with the United States government, most of the documents about the unit never really made it to the public, and all but a handful of its staff remain alive. How they managed to get so many people to hate the others so much that it didn't bother them to gas mothers and their infants, let alone do the plethora of other heinous things that I just mentioned, is astonishing. Every member of the unit who was asked why they had done what they did had precisely the same type of reply that you would expect. I was ordered. TikTok is far more dangerous than we thought. In the past two years, at least 15 kids, aged 12 or younger, across the globe from Milwaukee to Sicily, have painfully passed on after attempting